Yeah, thank you. And thank you for inviting me here and Paige and Noam for providing all of the support and getting me here. So welcome to everyone. Some of you are old friends and some are new. Well, I think because we've got a relatively small group of people, we'll just go around and do some introductions in a minute. But first, we'll just sit and settle in. One of the things that we always do in Buddhist practice is set our intention, set our motivation for our time together today. And so just reflecting on what brought us here, what we'd like to get out of the session today, which is very personal. There's no right or wrong answer. It's just about doing our own reflection. And we say that when we do that, we get the most out of the experience if we go in with a strong clear intention. Things may change during the day as you get more information. Hopefully they will. They kind of always do. And but, you know, going in with a clear intention. So we'll sit for a minute and settle and then just maybe go around and do a little brief introductions of everyone so that we're all kind of get to know each other a little bit in the space. And so I invite you to just sit in a comfortable yet alert posture. So with your back straight, your hands can be resting in your lap or on your knees. Generally, we have our eyes closed or just slightly open. If you tend to get drowsy when meditating, you can have your eyes in a slightly hooded gaze. And our meditation posture for our tongue is on the roof of our mouth, right behind our teeth. That keeps us from having to swallow constantly. And as you settle into that posture, also just checking, taking a moment to just check in, making sure you're fully relaxed. So I invite you to just scan your attention through your body. Maybe scanning down from the crown of your head, paying attention to the area around your eyes. We often hold tension our forehead, deliberately relaxing. Scanning down through the jaw as much as we can. We meditate with our mouth closed, breathing through our nose, but with our jaw not clenched. In the neck and shoulders, where we can often hold tension and tightness, relaxing the neck and shoulders. Lifting the chest, opening up the sternum, getting that nice upright posture, but your body relaxed around it. The torso the belly, the buttocks, fully relaxed, all the way down to the feet. So we can join the qualities of alertness and relaxation. These two are not contradictory, but yet complementary. And then let's round off this initial settling of the body with three deep breaths. So three deep inhalation, full exhalation. And this helps activate the soothing system of the body, getting us more present, more relaxed in the space. And then for a few moments, is focusing on the sensations of the breath in the body. Wherever you can feel the sensations most clearly, it might be localized in the body. For example, the diaphragm rising and falling, maybe the chest expanding and contracting as the lungs expand and contract. Perhaps the subtlest place that we can notice the sensations right at the nostrils. Or maybe full body awareness of breathing. So just noticing the sensations in the body wherever they're apparent. I'm just taking a few moments to use the breath as the anchor to get yourself here. 
in your body, in the present moment. And thoughts arise, pull you away from the sensations of the breath, just gently release and return to the breath. And then taking a moment to reflect on our intention for coming today. What brought you here? Whether you're here physically or on Zoom. What impulse, what intention brought you to this space? Maybe you're a regular student here at San Francisco Dharma Collective. You like to attend whatever is offered, perhaps something about the topic through you. Maybe you're going through a challenging time in your life and felt that you needed some inspiration, whatever it might be, just taking a moment. There's no right or wrong answer, just whatever is true for you. And then in Buddhist practice, we always aspire to also an altruistic intention for all of our study, our practice, our discussion, thinking that, of course, we are inspired to benefit ourselves, but also adding the aspiration, may our time together today also be of benefit to all living beings. So expanding that intention, that motivation, whatever we learn, whatever insights we receive from the practices today, may they also be of benefit to others as well. Okay, thank you so much. And welcome to everyone. So our, our subject today is going to be uh, the four immeasurables as they're known in the Tibetan tradition in the insight or the Theravadan tradition, they're known more as the four Brahma Viharas. Alan Wallace, the meditation teacher, calls them the four virtues of the heart, which I really like as well. I think I might have used that in the publicity. And so these are practices held in common and practiced in common in all Buddhist traditions and actually even predate Buddhism. There's a whole story about how they're found in ancient Indian philosophy, philosophical traditions that even predate Buddhism. And they're also just universal human values. There's something that can be practiced from a certain perspective in Buddhism and also just universal human qualities that make us have a happier and more fulfilling life, no matter whether we're Buddhist or not. So there is a perspective in Buddhism, but also, you know, just sort of general virtuous qualities. And we'll talk a lot about each one of the qualities, but just for those of you who might not be familiar, the qualities are loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. So today we're going to be going through each one, explaining what it is, what's involved in 
that quality and also doing a lot of practice today as well. So we'll do meditations on each of the qualities and some of them will do more than one practice involved in the quality. We'll also have time, plenty of time for discussion if there's questions and so on. I think Noam was asking, Noam was hosting on Zoom and was asking about breakout rooms. It's nice to do at least one, especially after lunch, to get people energized. So we'll do at least one kind of discussion breakout room with a prompt. But a lot of today will be focused on practice and exploration of these four qualities. And so for me, I remember when I first started studying Tibetan Buddhism, I had considered myself, that's why when Cage said, how long have you been practicing? It's like, I started meditating in 1973. Is that 50 years ago? It is, isn't it? But that, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. Yes. <laughs> and then I think was more exposed to Buddhist philosophy in the late seven in the late seventies, a little after starting to do a meditation practice. And then I remember when I was exposed to the Tibetan tradition specifically, which became kind of my root tradition, and that was 1991. And I was in Dharamsala, India, where His Holiness the Dalai Lama lives, and doing an introductory 10-day course in Tibetan Buddhism. And I hadn't studied Tibetan Buddhism. And there's this beautiful framing of these four qualities that was so inspiring. I just loved it so much. And there was a prayer that was done. And for each of these, they this kind of extensive prayer in the Tibetan tradition has a wish, an aspiration, a resolve, and a request for inspiration. And I was coming from a totally secular, kind of been doing meditation practice, but not really, you know, engaged in Buddhist philosophy. But I was really inspired by this idea of bodhicitta, the idea that you can like motivate every action in your life to be of benefit to others and actually attain spiritual realization for the benefit of others. I'd always been motivated by that idea, even though I hadn't really had any training in it. But these four immeasurables felt like it really gave me a way to kind of manifest that aspiration. And the, the way it was framed that inspired me so much for example, for loving kindness, the wish, how wonderful it would be if all sentient beings had happiness and its causes. So how wonderful, wouldn't that be awesome, right? Just this sort of a wish. And then the aspiration, may they have happiness and its causes. And then we raise the bar even more with the resolve. I myself will cause them to have happiness and its causes. So not just some like, wouldn't it be nice if they did it somehow? I don't know, whatever. Yeah, let them do it. And then the request for inspiration. And this is where we request our guiding teachers, beings, both embodied and not, because Buddhism says that we're being guided by beings you know, not only our own physical teachers that we actually talk to and can relate to. And so in this line, it says, please, Guru Buddha, bless me to be able to do this. And the idea of blessing, the Tibetan word literally means something like, help me transform my mind, right? So it's not like this passive thing of like, bless me, just bonk me over the head with the magic wand and make it be so. But it's this idea of like, may I be open to your inspiring guidance. That's kind of literally what the Tibetan words mean. So when we talk about blessing, it's not a passive thing. It's like, oh, let me be open to transformation. Like, help me be open to transforming my mind instead of closed off right? So help me be open. So anyway, the very beginning, I found this all very, very inspiring. And so I love teaching about the four immeasurables because it was really a root practice for me. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for sharing a little bit about your background and why you're here. And, you know, just a shout out to Eve. If for anybody, I'll just reciprocate by shouting out my teacher, Eve, who I met in 2013, when I did the Cultivating Emotional Balance teacher training, and she was one of my own teachers. So we've kind of been reciprocal learners and Dharma friends and teacher-student relationship reciprocally for that whole time. And she was, I actually talked to her on the phone yesterday. 
And she was saying that Wednesday night's completely packed and there's hardly room for anybody else. And that just made me so happy that people are, you know, after the years of the pandemic, that people are actually putting their pants on and coming in person. Because <laughs> you know, we all got a little lazy there. And so, and, you know, it's so great to have the hybrid set up too, so that the people who can't come put their pants on and come down the street or across town or across the country can join from wherever we are. It's such a wonderful gift of, of the pandemic, but it is really nice to have people in person. So I'm really glad, you know, to have the opportunity to be with all of you in person. I've taught I've taught rooms full of all of you here, and I've been Zooming in from Santa Cruz a couple of times, but it's really nice to be here with all of you. And yeah, and anybody who hasn't attended Wednesday night, give it a try, because it's awesome. So before we get into talking about the specific immeasurables, I just wanted to talk about this kind of principle in spiritual practice in general and Buddhist contemplative practice particularly, which is the idea of mental cultivation through contemplation, which is really the basis of our Buddhist practice. And sometimes it's not talked about so much explicitly, but I think, you know, it's, it's really worth kind of lifting up this idea of actually changing and cultivating qualities in our mind through contemplation and through our meditative practice. And so this is the principle underlying Buddhist meditation practice. When we talk about Buddhist meditation, we usually kind of uh, distinguish two broad streams of contemplative practice. One is sometimes called single-pointed concentration or focusing meditation, where we train our mind's ability to stay focused on an object without distraction. So, for example, the breath, the sensations of the breath, what we did at the very beginning as part of our practice was, can we keep our attention focused and trained on one object and develop that, can, that kind of ability to be able to focus? There's many objects that we can focus on. The breath is found in all Buddhist traditions. It's a very you know, kind of traditional object of focus. And then there's other, other objects of focus as well. So that's one stream of Buddhist practice. And the point of doing that isn't that attentional training in and of itself has much benefit. It does have some benefits, but the point is to be able to train our minds so that then when we do the second kind of type of Buddhist practice, we have this really well-developed kind of laser sharp mind to focus on what we think of as more the conceptual or analytical meditations in the in the Tibetan tradition specifically, we have a whole toolbox of these more con conceptual and analytical meditations. Some are to gain realizations on the path. For example, the meditation on impermanence, for example, the fact that things are changing moment by moment by moment. The Buddha said a big cause of suffering for us is our lack of understanding of impermanence. We want things to stay the same. Well, let's be clear. We want the good things to last forever. We freak out because we think the bad things will also last forever, and neither of those is true. And so having a more flexible approach to things, which we can do through meditation. So there's traditional impermanence meditations that we can do to gain those realizations. So some of the contemplative practices or some of the conceptual practices are just about gaining an understanding of some truth about the nature of reality, right? Like impermanence. Also emptiness, another big topic, is something that we meditate on. And then there's another kind of stream of the contemplative and analytical ones where we're developing these virtuous qualities and the four immeasurables and contemplation meditation on the four immeasurables fits into that kind of subset of contemplative practice. So we say because of this ability to cultivate our minds through contemplation, we can actually cultivate these qualities like loving kindness and compassion. And there's a specific reason the word cultivation, it's a translation of the Sanskrit bhavana, which is used as a, you know, as a word for meditation. 
And we talk about cultivating as allowing something that's already there to grow stronger, right? We don't say we're planting or transplanting or somehow newly putting in to our hearts and minds, loving kindness and compassion. We have naturally loving kindness and compassion, all beings. So the cultivation means how do we make it just like cultivating a crop? When you weed, get rid of the obstacles, add fertilizer, compost, whatever. So that's why we use specifically the word cultivation, because what we're trying to do is take something that we have innately as human beings, as living beings, because other beings also have innate compassion and loving kindness. There's a big debate. That's kind of interesting to, to talk about. But how do we then take that kind of seed or that sprout, or maybe it's already a pretty big sapling of loving kindness and compassion and grow it even bigger. And that's what these four virtues of the heart practices are meant to do. So the way that we usually do that is the first step is what I think of as kind of a priming step. Most of us don't prime our pumps by pouring water down it. But if you've read any of those books or you know what, you know, there's this idea that you get the juices flowing by a priming step. And so what we usually do in the first step of these practices is think of someone for whom we naturally feel loving kindness or that we naturally feel compassion. You know, we mostly do for at least someone in our lives or our household pets. Some of you mentioned your pets. I know Mar Marcella has this cute dog. So sometimes it's even a pet. Who do we feel that kind of natural feeling for? And then so we start with that and then we expand outward in sort of these concentric circles to see if we can take that feeling that we naturally have and make it broader. So that's what we do in the practice. Can we then the people that we're maybe not quite as close to, and then maybe the neutral people, the people that we mostly have indifference towards, right? Because we don't hate the person that bags our groceries at Whole Foods or whatever, but we just don't give them any thought. We certainly don't really think about their happiness and suffering, probably, mostly. We just sort of treat them with indifference. And then the harder cases, right? Maybe people who've done us wrong personally, right? So in stages over time, and what we'll do today, we'll do these practices and we'll do all these concentric circles today just as a way of showing how it's done. But I really encourage you in your practice not to go too far too fast, right? People always, when I teach an eight-week compassion training that was developed at Stanford, and the first day people always say, well, wait, how do I have compassion for fill in the blank? For a long time, it was our former president. Then it turned into Vladimir Putin for a while. This week, we may have some other characters. And like Noam said, you know, this is, it's interesting because I did a day long, I often do these day long four measurables. And I was telling Noam this morning when I came in, I remember really clearly setting up months ahead of time to do a day long for a measurables retreat in Santa Cruz at Insight Santa Cruz in 2016, in November of 2016. And then it happened to be four days after the presidential election in 2016. And in hippie, liberal, progressive Santa Cruz, you can imagine how people were feeling. Not that that, you know, is everybody's political views at all. And, you know, I'm not saying anything partisan, but that was what the room full of people. So I'm kind of feeling that now, this week, too. You know, there's so much going on, so much suffering going on, people taking sides, right? So how do we keep our hearts open? How do we approach, you know, the wish to relieve the suffering of all beings can be really, really challenging. So I really encourage you, as I said, as I lead you through these practices, to just go at your own pace. I'll introduce, but if it's going too far to think of even the personal you know, hard, hard person that's hard to open your heart to. These practices do work over time, but don't go too far too fast, right? So in Buddhist practice, we sometimes talk about 
the friend, the enemy, and the stranger. But it can be groups of people too. You know, it's traditionally presented as the personal friend, the person who really has your back, and then the stranger, and then the enemy, like again, personal. But there may be groups of people that we see as other. Right. And so I encourage us to use this practice also if we notice ourselves othering people and feeling that there's an entire group of people that's outside our realm of compassion, maybe consider investigating and challenging and over time working with these practices. One of the advantages, I mean, these so many advantages to these practices, you know, it really does support that bodhisattva kind of intention and, and sort of form to our life. And they make us feel better and happier. And we all know how much better it feels when our hearts are open and connected, rather than shut down and disconnected, right? So, it's something that, you know, in so many studies done, positive psychologists that have nothing to do with Buddhism, and everyone says social connection is like the lead, social connection, gratitude, and forgiveness are like the three big things that always come at the top of the list of like, what makes us happiest in our own lives? So that feeling of care, that feeling of connection to others is a cause for happiness for us too. And it makes everybody around us feel happier too. Wouldn't you rather be around somebody who is kind and compassionate than somebody who is completely self-absorbed and bitter and blaming, right? So some of the advantages of these practices and that ability to be able to develop these qualities. It's not like, I would say, it's not like you're born Mother Teresa or you're hopeless. You know, there's a researcher at Stanford called Carol Dweck, and she talks about a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. And she says, people with a fixed mindset think, oh, I'm born with certain qualities, certain abilities. That's just sort of fixed. That's just who I am. Just kind of cope with it, get used to it. And then people with a growth mindset have more of an approach of like, yeah, I can really develop my mind. I can learn new things. I can change aspects of, you know, my default ways of approaching life in ways that are, you know, less than exemplary. So a gross mindset kind of goes along with this idea of mental cultivation through contemplation, which is the basis of the practices that we're going to be doing today. You know, and I found in my own like lengthy experience, shocking to think I've been meditating for 50 years. I think I should be way more enlightened than I am. That's sort of daunting. I'm like, oh no, okay, gonna have to rethink that. And <laughs> you have no idea what I was like when I started. <laughs> so there has been a lot of improvement. And I think that the compassion and the kindness, which has just been such root practices for me. And I really can't say, yeah, I'm certainly see, you know, the development development over the years. I mean, I still have very much a work in progress, have so much farther to go. And I see how much my default response is looking for common humanity, like looking for common ground, trying to put myself in the other person's shoes, like trying to have empathy, even with people that I don't understand. And I certainly didn't start out that way you know, at all. I mean, I came from a family that was super kind of judgy and critical. And then I just noticed these habits of mind of just critic, you know, criticism and judgment and how painful it was. And I remember really clearly when I was really inspired to take these virtues of the heart to heart, because I saw them as the antidote to my hypercritical judgy mind that just made me so negative and kind of bitter all the time. And I can say, you know, like I said, there's a lot more work to be done, but sometimes I surprise myself in my ability to hold compassion, even to people who've done great harm, you know, not condoning at all a harmful action, but you know, separating the person from the action, doing whatever I can to prevent harm while still holding the person in my heart with love and compassion. And that's hard. That's hard. Right. And that's kind of the ask for us in Buddhist practice. But I'm certainly not going to pretend that that's easy, but it is a practice and it is something we can aspire to. So that's kind of the 
kind of philosophical underpinnings of doing these practices and doing these meditations. So we'll begin with the meditation on loving kindness. That's often the first of these four immeasurables. By the way, just a little bit of some more about the kind of the semantics. So they're called immeasurable for two reasons. One is immeasurable in terms of the scope or extent of the objects of those qualities. So immeasurable loving kindness, for example, means to all beings, to infinite beings, not leaving anyone out. So the aspiration is, can we, over time, Buddhism would say many lifetimes, develop immeasurable loving kindness, meaning infinite objects of that feeling of loving kindness, and also immeasurable in terms of sort of the depth or intensity of that feeling. And they often say for loving kindness, like a mother would have for their only child, you know, in those things that I'm not a parent physically in this life, but some of you I know are. And just that thing that I would just do anything for this child, even like jump in front of the speeding bus or whatever, you know, sad. could we have that intensity of love towards all beings and all beings? So it's kind of a depth and breadth, I, I think of it, this word immeasurable. And then they're also in the Theravadan tradition called the four Brahma Viharas. And there are a couple of different meanings of this, but abodes of Brahma, Vihara means abodes. And, you know, one way of thinking of it is in these exalted states of kind of realization, it's like being in some sort of a godly realm or a godly abode, like your mind is actually in one of these sort of godly abodes, one of these sort of pure realms. So that's one way of thinking of Brahma Vihara, one of the other words that's used for these. So the first one, loving kindness, and I'll introduce that, then we'll do a practice and then we'll have our first, we're already up to our first break. Oh my gosh, how does this happen? So the first one, usually translated as loving kindness, which is kind of a weird word in English. We don't usually talk about loving kindness outside of the context of Buddhist practice. And so loving kindness, the word in Sanskrit is maitri, and the word in Pali is metta. And some of you have probably heard of metta practice, loving kindness practice. And so loving kindness is defined as the wish for others to have happiness. So it's sort of a proactive wish for others to have happiness. Whereas compassion, which is the second one, is a wish for beings to be free from suffering. So even though sometimes love and kindness and compassion are used kind of uh, synonymously in English, they mean something quite different in Buddhist practice. So loving kindness has a vision, has a vision of others flourishing, has a vision of others well-being. <clears throat> so that kind of positive intention. And the root relates to the word for friendliness. And in fact, I remember hearing a, a talk once, and it was Sharon Salzberg and Roshi Joan Halifax were giving a co-teaching on loving kindness. And I can't remember which one it said it was. Maybe it was Sharon Salzberg said she prefers the translation friendliness. And I think Roshi Jones said she prefers connection. So she uses the word connection. But it's this flavor of, you know, friendliness, love, connection, kindness towards others, wishing them well, instead of being happy when they're suffering, you know, we wish them to have flourishing and wellness and so forth. And so we'll do a practice. I'll pause for a minute to see if there are any questions, and then I'll lead you through. And in this practice, we'll look at those kind of concentric circle level that we've been doing. But first of all, any questions, because I've been doing a lot of talking, any questions about anything that I've been saying about contemplation or the practices or loving kindness and anybody in the Zoom room. I've got you next to me. I'm sorry you have to look at the side of my face, but I wanted you close because there's a whole screen across the room, but I also have my laptop. So any any questions to clarify? 
Oh, yes. Yeah, Kara and then Connie. Yeah. Earlier you mentioned the three things that create happiness. It was gratitude and social connection and something else. I think it's forgiveness. Forgiveness. I'm not a hundred percent sure. I'm not a hundred, but I believe like in all of the studies of positive psychology that I know for sure gratitude and social connection. Okay. I'm not a hundred percent sure about their forgiveness, but in all of these studies, there are these things that always get ranked as like main causes of happiness. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you could mention the four again. I know there's uh, loving kindness and compassion. And empathetic joy mm -hmm. and equanimity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good save. <Woo. laughs> okay, do you guys need to get up and stretch for a minute and reposition? Yeah, maybe a stretch. Then you all at home are also welcome to get up and stretch. Maybe you've been stretching more than the people sitting here. And by the way, while we're all stretching, just another piece that I wanted to mention is we also are encouraged to uh, practice all of these qualities towards ourselves. And in the very, very traditional Tibetan Buddhist practice, a lot of the texts say, well, for the priming step, start with yourself, because of course you feel more loving kindness and compassion to yourself than you do to anyone else. And we go, that's really complicated, okay? And we can't leave ourselves out. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more today, especially in terms of self-compassion. And we'll do a self-compassion practice because sometimes apply, like when we think about the concentric circles, Sometimes ourselves are way out in the concentric circles, you know, maybe even after the neutral person, often after the loved one, often for us thinking of ourselves, right? And, you know, it, it, it's complicated and we have a lot of complicated feelings towards ourselves and often that's not the default you know, loving kindness that we express towards ourselves. So we'll talk about that. We'll look about that. We'll look at that. One of the founders of the compassion training that was developed at Stanford is Geshe Thupten Jimpa, who's His Holiness the Dalai Lama's main English translator, and was a monk for many, many years and trained in Tibetan monasteries very, very traditionally. And when he came and started developing this training at Stanford, he just thought, well, we start with ourselves. And then he found all these people are just hitting a brick wall. Like, why is this not working? And I've heard him talk about it and he goes, I don't know what's up with y'all, but it's obviously complicated. So I had to switch the order and start with the loved one and then the self and then kind of go from there. So we won't skip over it, but just to acknowledge at the very beginning that it's definitely complicated. So the practice I want to lead you through in these sort of concentric circles come from a very, very traditional Buddhist practice. And so this is sort of the order that it's often done. And so we'll experiment with this and then have a couple of minutes to hear how it went and then have a slightly longer break. So I invite you to, again, get into your comfortable posture with your back straight and your shoulders even. And just taking a moment or two to focus on your breath is a way to settle back into the space, get yourself here in the present moment, in your bodies. And so now we're going to begin this mental cultivation through contemplation. So keeping this idea in mind of this growth mindset, this mental cultivation. 
And so we'll begin with the first step, which is the priming step to get a feel for this quality of loving kindness, not just the idea, but possibly even a felt sense, really attuning to what it feels like in our bodies. And so beginning by generating a feeling of loving kindness in your heart. And you can do this by bringing to mind someone you love. So this can be someone, kind of an uncomplicated relationship. It may be somebody like your best friend, somebody that you just really wish them well. It's easy for you to feel feelings of warmth and care. So I invite you, if it's possible, to just imagine that person seated in front of you. If you can get a visual image or even just a felt sense of that person's presence. So even if it's not easy to get a visual image, just get a felt sense of their presence. And as that person's presence becomes real for you, as you get that feeling of them there with you, just notice those feelings that arise. It might even be a physical sensation of warmth in your heart. Just notice whatever sensations and feelings accompany that person's presence, maybe some thoughts in your mind. And as you tune into that natural feeling of loving kindness for your loved one, you might imagine it as a warm, bright light or a gentle, positive energy radiating out from your heart. And along with that visualization of that radiant, warm energy, that bright light from your heart, you can recite the phrases, may you be happy, may you be well. May all your needs and wishes be fulfilled. May you be happy, may you be well. May all your needs and wishes be fulfilled. And now let the visualization of your loved one dissolve back into the space of your mind. And now send that energy of loving kindness to yourself. So we've primed it, we have felt it, we have visualized it. So keeping that visualization alive, keeping that felt sense alive, sending that love to yourself. So loving yourself means accepting yourself as you are with all of your present faults and shortcomings. It means being a friend to yourself rather than being angry and frustrated that you aren't the person you'd like to be. It means acknowledging your positive potential 
holding yourself in that growth mindset, seeing your potential to transform. And so really sincerely wishing yourself all of the happiness, all of the flourishing that's possible, sending that warm energy out from your heart. You can imagine it filling your body, those wishes of loving kindness towards yourself. May I be happy. May I be well. May all my needs and wishes be fulfilled. May I be happy, may I be well. May all my needs and wishes be fulfilled. And then next, generating loving kindness for your family, your parents, whether they're still alive or not, your other family members. You have children, brothers and sisters, a spouse. And again, you can imagine your family members seated in front of you or get a felt sense of their presence thinking of these people who have supported you in your life, especially your parents, whether you got along with them or not, but did their best to raise you, to sacrifice from the time you were a baby, your other family members. So imagine them seated around or get a felt sense of their presence in front of you. And sending that same warm, bright light out from your heart towards your family members, thinking, may you be well, may you be happy, and may all your needs and wishes be fulfilled. If you'd like to take a moment to visualize specifically what that means for each of those family members, you can Make your visualization even more specific. Imagining what flourishing would be like for those family members. As you continue to send those thoughts of loving kindness, may you be well, may you be happy, may all your needs and wishes be fulfilled. Continuing to imagine that warm light going up from your heart. Imagine all your family members really bathed in that energy of loving kindness.
and then allow the visualization of your family members to dissolve back into the space of your mind. And now think of your teachers, people who have really benefited you in your life and your friends. So people that have really supported you in all kinds of ways, emotionally, through teaching you, through being there for you, through being a mentor for you. And again, imagining this group of people seated in front of you, if it's easy to get a clear visual image or just getting a felt sense of the presence of these people, people who've really been important and helping you and supporting you in your life. And as you visualize these people, you might think of the specific things that all of them have done to support you. And in addition to loving kindness, you might notice a sense of gratitude arising. And sending that same warm light out from your heart to this group of people, thinking, may you be well, may you be happy, may your needs and wishes be fulfilled. May you be well, may you be happy, may your needs and wishes be fulfilled. And now let the visualization of this group of people, your mentors, your teachers, your friends, dissolve back into the space of your mind. And now we're going to do something a bit more challenging. And so go at your own pace. If it feels too challenging, that's okay. You can just put it to the side for now or pick somebody different to send your loving kindness to. But... Now see if we might be able to extend that loving kindness to somebody even that you have a difficult relationship with. And perhaps for this meditation, not picking the most difficult person in your life, but maybe somebody that you just find irritating or annoying, somebody you try and avoid, maybe somebody who's hurt your feelings made you feel disrespected, somebody you just dislike. Again, go easy on yourself, maybe picking a mild case, but imagining that person seated in front of you or getting a felt sense of their presence. And thinking this person, even though you find them so annoying and irritating and feel aversion for them, but they're a human being that wishes to be happy, wishes to be free from problems, wishes to be loved and to love just as you do. And see if you can imagine sending that warm, loving energy to this person, wishing them to be free of the confusion and maybe anger and self-centeredness that drive them to do 
the actions that they do that are harmful to others or harmful to you. But sending out that sincere wish for them to find peace of mind, happiness, for their needs and wishes to be fulfilled. So imagine sending that light out from your heart. May you be well, may you be happy, may all your needs and wishes be fulfilled. It may not feel as heartfelt as some of the other categories, but just having the willingness, even just the willingness as a first step to try and extend your loving kindness to this person. May you be well, may you be happy. May all your needs and wishes be fulfilled. And then allow the visualization of this person to dissolve back into the space of your mind. And then finally, we'll widen that circle to all beings. Generate loving kindness for all living beings, both human and non-human. And in this moment, especially, we might like to think of people going through extreme difficulties. War, poverty, hunger, fear, oppression. So sending out that warm light of loving kindness, imagining the immeasurability, and we send it out to all living beings. You can imagine that warm light radiating out from your heart. Thinking may all beings everywhere be well, may they be happy, may all their needs and wishes be fulfilled. Extending that warm light of loving kindness out from your heart. And you can imagine now, as that light touches all beings, it actually gives them comfort, relieves them from their mental and physical sufferings, and really helps them to experience happiness and peace of mind. So imagine the outcome of your loving kindness being flourishing, wellness, happiness, ease, peace of mind.
And then releasing the visualization <clears throat> and returning to your breath and just noticing what sensations are alive in your body, whatever thoughts there might be in your mind. And just resting in that feeling of loving kindness, deepening it by savoring that experience for a moment. And just taking a moment to gently come out of that meditation practice. Oh. And so any any reflections or questions or comments? Yeah, Sarah. I find when I think of my own happiness. Thank you. <laughs> uh, when I think of my own happiness, there's like a dependency on things outside myself um, being okay. Like people I worry about, people who are going through a hard time I'm close to. Mm. And that shakes my own inner happiness. Yeah. So it's like that, how, you know, how can you be happy when you rise so much outside that's, you know, maybe things are okay here. But For you, yeah. 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 That's such an interesting question. What do you think? Uh, like, do you have any, you know, as a, as a well-trained Buddhist practitioner, do any ideas come up for you? Because I have some ideas, but I'd love to hear if there's any thing that sort of naturally comes up for you. I'm not, I know that sometimes I'll try and catch myself feeling joy, even in moments when I'm like, also worried about someone. Yeah. Like maybe I'll be yeah. like, out yeah. walking my dog and it's a beautiful day and I can like appreciate that moment. And it's sort of like, uh, some, yeah. you know, like yeah. the sun and the air and like just sort of little things that yeah. bring me back to like, oh, I'm not actually like, completely in this worry place there's also all these other things so that's a little helpful yeah but does it feel at all I mean I'm I'm curious because I think sometimes it can feel almost like a betrayal if we're happy when people we love are suffering so it's hard to yeah, let ourselves so. really like so much that's yeah not going right in the world yeah. like how can I just wallow in this like so like our anxiety is necessary so to feel that we're not betraying suffering others almost like that yeah yeah right and we do we kind of feel that way like that we're disloyal to the people that we love that are suffering if we're okay that we need to kind of match their level of anxiety or something like that and you know to me I mean, it's interesting. There's so many different angles to to approach this. One thing I think of when I think of like a teaching on how a bodhisattva engages with the world, like a bodhisattva is a concept of someone who is doing their spiritual practice with the wish to reach the highest spiritual aim of full enlightenment in order to be a perfect benefit to others, right? So there's all of these teachings about how does such a being engage with the world, engage with suffering. And there's the idea of going in with that altruistic motivation, understanding dependency and cause and effect while doing the beneficial action, even if it's just a loving kindness meditation, and then being completely 
not attached to the outcome. So there's this idea that we put our beneficial energy into a situation knowing that every experience that someone else and ourselves experiences is such a complex result of so many causes and conditions that we can't make it better, no matter how hard we try, right? And our, and our positive energy and our care for others are part of the complex kind of soup of causes and conditions. So we don't, we don't go to the extreme of going, oh, it doesn't matter at all, nor do we go the extreme of going, I can fix it by my efforts, right? So there's a certain letting go, like out of integrity, we do the right thing. We show up with as positive as an energy as we can with whatever wisdom we bring to bear. But then there's a understanding of like the dependent arising of everything that makes us not attached to a specific outcome and realizing, you know, the other metaphor that's often given is that you can't save a drowning person by jumping into the stream and drowning along with them. You need to be standing on the solid bank to lift them up. So us, you know, and we, we think of that when we talk about empathy and this empathic kind of overwhelm that we can feel the feelings of another so much that we're completely overwhelmed. And then suddenly they're comforting us. Like they're the one going through the thing and we're so freaked out and overreactive at what they're going through. You know, so there's this idea that even if we can bring that positivity and that happiness, it's not this frivolous happiness that's not aware, but it's that deep like joy of connection and meaning and you know so it's sort of like the happiness that comes from like sensory experiences but then there's a deeper sense of well-being that aristotle called eudaimonia eve probably talks about that in a lot of her classes that's this deep sense of well-being that comes from feeling like what we're doing is meaningful or we're bringing these virtuous qualities to the experience so even in the face of suffering, we can feel that deep well-being of like, I'm engaged, I'm caring, I'm trying, I'm bringing that energy to the thing. Anyway, so much to say, but those are some of the things that come up. Does that That's help? Helpful. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's not a betrayal to feel that eudaimonic connection and meaning and, you know, which feels good to us and is fully conscious of the distress of the other person. Yeah, yeah. Great. Gosh, we could spend the rest of the day on that question. And I see Jenny and Marnie have your hands up. Jenny, you want to go first? And then we'll have a break after the rest. Jenny? Yeah, there you go. Um. As a, a nurse for decades and as an empath, I have prayed for others, patients, friends, many, many, many times. Yeah. May you be happy. May you be free from suffering. And I always thought that um, I'm very blessed in my life. I have good teachers. I, in meditation, I have feel the divine love, so I'm being taken care of. Mm. But today, when I do this meditation, when I say, may I be happy, may mm. I be free from suffering, I felt I have really ever said that to myself. Yeah. Yeah. And that is self abandonment. Mm. I always thought I'm a loving, kind person, but the person that needs most mm. and that's, I didn't give it to myself. That's, mm really self-abandonment and it's the mm. most loving thing one can do to oneself <laughs> so i always hear teachers say 
you are a sentient being too. <laughs> and I need to reclaim that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Jenny. I mean, in the room, so many heads are nodding on Zoom screen. And it's, you know, sometimes much easier for us to extend love and care and compassion to others and so hard to extend to ourselves. And we'll look at this a little bit more. I wanted to spend some time on this today just because it is such a hard one and a, even an obstacle, even I would go so far as to call it an obstacle for some of us. You know, I've I've heard so many people say, sometimes it's conditioning of family, of culture, of gender. You know, many women say they were raised that it's so selfish to think of yourself at all, especially of a certain generation, like my generation and older. And, you know, so many causes for that. So we'll 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 get into it. What I want to do, I'll lead probably first thing this afternoon after our lunch break is self-compassion practice, and we'll talk about self-compassion a bit, which will also kind of inform the self-kindness practices. But exactly what you've noticed, Jenny, how and it's so poignant and makes us so sad to realize how little we've extended it to ourselves. You know, when your experience, when you realize, wow, I've cared for others my whole life and very, very rarely extended that same care and concern to myself. So thank you for that really vulnerable, tender share. I, you know, I think we're all feeling a resonance with, with what you said. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Marnie. And then we'll take a break. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Tenzin. Um, very, very powerful uh, meditation. And I've done this, you know, this, this meditation many times. And today is the first time that, you know, I brought my daughter to mind initially. And instead of her, it, you know, she, this warm golden light kind of came and was, you know, moving and, and uh, as, you know, I went to myself and then of course to family and, you know, and, and outward, it was the, the golden glow for me. Um, this light changed and this is the first time that's ever happened. So I, uh, greatly appreciate, uh, your, 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 uh, you know, your words and to be able to experience that. Um, mm. it's just absolutely amazing. I feel amazing. And I'm looking so forward to the self-compassion part that you're going to do next. I know everyone's getting a little restless time for a break. Um, because again, I think I completely can echo those same words. And so I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. Beautiful. Oh, thank you for sharing that experience, you know, and it doesn't always, you know, we, we hope for the felt sense and maybe it doesn't happen every meditation. Maybe it just happens from time to time, but it's sort of like trusting the practice and we just keep doing the practice out of trust of this tradition that's been going on for 2,600 years and has worked to produce these amazing beings and not having the expectation. It'll always give us that felt sense but it's moments like what you just experienced, Marnie, and that kind of keeps us in the game of like, oh, yeah, <laughs> you know, that can happen. And you really experience that shift in your heart and mind, you know, through the practice. So I'm so glad that was meaningful for you. Thank you. So let's take a break. So we still waiting for people to come back from the bio break, but any questions before we get into the next topic? I thought we could just start if there's any other questions or comments from the practice or, yeah, Anna. Oh, so, there's the mic. So when we were doing the exercise, is it on? Um, I was wondering if, uh, I found that it was very much related to Tong Len, the taking, the giving, giving. Uh, in that regard. Okay. We, uh, we actually, for that one, it was mostly the giving. Mm -hmm, We're just right. giving. So when we talk about Tong Len, which means taking and giving, we it's a combination of both loving kindness and compassion practice. So the giving is the loving kindness part. Mm -hmm. You may not be 
<laughs> my lovely assistant the gift, brought me the thinking, gift. speaking of giving she, I'm thanks for it so the giving part is the loving kindness part like we have kind of a vision and we're giving the happiness and giving the well-being and then in tong len which maybe we'll do later i hadn't planned on it but maybe that would be nice to do we're taking away the suffering so that's the perfect segue to compassion because compassion is defined as the wish to relieve others of suffering whereas loving kindness defined as the wish to give them happiness and flourishing yeah yeah so this meditation we just did was sort of the giving piece because it was focused more on the loving kindness yeah i like that and also um when we said uh, uh, may you have your wishes fulfilled mm -hmm. so i was thinking well sometimes we don't have very good wishes <laughs> so <laughs> i was thinking maybe it's um or in my mind i was thinking oh maybe your virtuous wishes yeah yeah be fulfilled that's so funny that you say that i often tell a story of a conversation that happened during a teaching and this is probably 10 years ago or so and there was a tibetan buddhist lama teaching you know and i can't remember if it was tonglen or whatever and a student asked exactly this question he said if somebody thinks they want like a new girlfriend or a new job those are all just causes of suffering ultimately it's not like liberation and enlightenment so why should i wish and then lama's like give him a girlfriend imagine <laughs> giving him a job like it's okay give him one. Give them whatever they want like it doesn't mean that you don't also aspire to the greater but we don't like judge what somebody wishes so i mean you don't wish them something non-virtuous but even ordinary pleasures all the way up to virtuous mm -hmm. you know qualities like liberation and enlightenment so that was what this teacher was like it's okay just relax like give them whatever they want like imagine because again it's for our mind imagining all kinds of flourishing right and instead of our mind being stingy with others happiness it's really about developing our own capacity to be generous really with our aspirations so everything all the way through you know the most virtuous things but that's such a great question too because sometimes we can be like oh this person really is lonely and they want a relationship but oh man <laughs> do i really want that for them? <laughs> right. you know and then it's like no go ahead like that you know give them some measure of happiness even you know the temporary one yeah 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 and then the other question for me was um when we do this kind of thing like uh, sharing light giving out light is it actually a blessing that we're doing well you know it's interesting Interesting. the question often comes does it have any impact on the other person like is it something that they're is it just for us and it's just our own mental cultivation or is there any kind of impact and i always say i always joke and say i'm from santa cruz so i'm allowed to talk about vibes you know <laughs> which i believe there is some you know i believe there's all kinds of ways of communicating and experiencing things that aren't just limited to the five senses for sure Sure. I mean, that's been, you know, I think there is, you know, a way and there's even I, I've even heard of experiments done, you know, just scientific experiments that somebody's like having surgery and they don't even know it. But their sister-in-law's Southern Baptist prayer group is praying for them and their recovery rates of the surgery are much higher if somebody's sending them good thoughts. So who knows? But there seemed to be a fair amount of evidence and then I think about, you know, again, going back to this idea of the bodhisattva's wish to be of benefit to beings, we say the more karmic connections we have with beings, the more ability we have to actually benefit them. And when you're imagining sending happiness and taking suffering from someone, even though you're just doing it in the privacy of your own meditation cushion, you're creating powerful connections and powerful causes to actually stay connected to that person and potentially when you have the ability when you've developed your own ability to really be able to be a benefit to them in a more 
you know, in, in a more ultimate way, like to lead them to enlightenment or lead them out of suffering. So I think both levels in the short term, I do believe that there is some kind of energy thing, for lack of a better word. And then for the long term, we're creating powerful causes to be able to be of ultimate benefit. And then people say, oh, well, I'm imagining benefiting someone. What if they're really a Buddha? Like, who am I to imagine benefiting somebody else? Like, what hubris <laughs> to imagine? And I'm like, if they're a Buddha, they'll be thrilled that you're doing this visualization. Don't worry about it. If they really are an enlightened being, they'll be totally stoked that you're imagining giving them happiness. Like, if they're manifesting suffering so that you can develop your compassion because they are an enlightened being. So don't, you know, all these things that we do, I think sometimes second guess our own virtuous intent. Right. So that's that's the thing too. Yeah, thank you. Great, great comments. Yeah, Jorge. I, I just want to make an announcement. Oh, okay. Um, two comments. There's a lady who spoke earlier once again. Wow, he's practicing loving kindness and generosity. <laughs> totally selfish. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> Sorry, you guys on Zoom. That was not, he said that he brought coffee and pastries for everybody. So <laughs> it might encourage you to come in person next time. So sorry about that. We'll visualize offering you the coffee and pastries that Jorge very kindly brought for us. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Well, maybe what we'll do, because I do want to not. Oh, yeah. Thanks. So towards the beginning, you were talking about um, the, the virtues of the heart and then the aspirations and our requests and like to be open to transform our mind. And I was kind of puzzled a little bit because when I think of the mind, I think more of intellectual. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and I was thinking, well, when I was a teacher, I would imagine in my mind some lessons, how I was going to put them into practice, you know, how yeah, the action. Yeah. So I was, uh, okay, so the mind to the action. But then I was wondering, okay, so, but... I want it to be in my heart. Yeah. As yeah well. so, right. Because you know how sometimes they say, and I'm one of them, that there are people who think too much. Yes. And and that it needs to come down to the heart. Yes. So can yeah. you explain? Plus, yeah. Make, you know, and it's so hard with our language. There's a Sanskrit word and Pali word also, chitta, that is hard to translate. And a lot of people translate it as heart mind or mind heart because there isn't seen as so much of a difference. Like for us, kind of with Western ideas about things, we think of mind as brain and only cognitive function. But in Asian traditions in general, in Buddhist traditions, there's this idea that there's this subtle consciousness and the seat of the most subtle consciousness is actually in the heart chakra. So there isn't seen as this separation between heart and mind. But what you say is, you know, really true. And I think and that's really a big part of what contemplative practice, the purpose of it is for things to kind of go below the neck, you know, because we can have an intellectual understanding of something, but nothing's moving, nothing's really shifting. And it's almost this felt sense that sometimes does feel like we have these words or phrases like open-hearted, warm-hearted, my heart open, because it's describing what we actually feel when we feel that shift, which is kind of what we're doing in that priming step. Like when we visualize the loved one is can we feel that almost that felt experience of the loving kindness? It isn't just this intellectual, oh, all beings deserve it. So I guess I should do, you know, I mean, so they work together, I think, but often when we think of a realization, we think of it as a deeper felt experience of something. Like even w what I was talking about with our contemplation, like even something like impermanence, we all understand impermanence. Most of us have taken some level of science and physics and we know, you know, the atoms are whirling around and they're not even atoms in the way with the, like the little diagram, the balls, it's these probability clouds and yada, yada. 
but we can go there. But we still freak out when something changes, like it hasn't gone below the neck, like we can understand it intellectually and write the diagrams, but nothing's changed in our hearts. And it's only through contemplation and exposing ourselves, first of all, intellectually, but then that realization comes when it's deepened from, like we use the conceptual and the intellectual to produce that shift that's at a deeper level, right? So that's kind of how it happens. Like even with this meditation, we think about this person, we think about, we visualize, we use our conceptual mind, but what we're hoping for then is that deepening of experience. So it's sort of both working together in a way. I mean, there is the cognitive piece, but it's meant to lead to that deeper heart shift, but it's almost our separation that we have in kind of Western philosophy of like the heart and the mind and the soul and the brain and the thing. And, the, you know, it's sort of seen as, as a false dichotomy in a way that, you know, but both are kind of working together. But that's why we start with the thoughts that we hope will then create that felt sense of, of opening. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about compassion, and then maybe we'll do the whole practice, the practice I wanted to do after talking about it after the lunch break. So compassion is, oh, one more little piece about loving kindness, the first immeasurable. We say that for each of the immeasurables, we talk about the phrasing is often a near enemy and a far enemy, or a direct enemy and an indirect enemy. And so the direct enemy or the far enemy is the complete opposite of that quality. So we say the opposite of loving kindness is hatred, right? So loving kindness is seen as an antidote to hatred or ill will or that kind of aversion because it, you know, we can't have both thoughts of loving kindness and thoughts of hatred towards the same object in our mind at the same time. It's impossible. We can flip really quickly, but it's said that we can't hold them simultaneously because they're mutually exclusive. And so loving kindness is the, is the antidote to hatred. But there's another quality that we can get, if our practice is just a little off base, we can think that we're developing loving kindness. And what we're actually doing is developing what we call the near enemy or the indirect enemy. So it's still not loving kindness, but it's close and we can get fooled. Anybody have a guess? Jorge. That's for another one. Like, hold, bookmark that. Hold that in mind because that's for another one. <laughs> that's also for another one. Yeah. <laughs> so excellent, hundred percent correct, but for another, another immeasurable. So what is the near enemy or the indirect? Like when we get our loving kindness just off base, not not pure loving kindness. What do you think? No, no. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Contempt is interesting, but not a near enemy for the loving kindness. Do you have an idea? You, you look, yeah, yeah. Or hey, do you remember? Oh, oh, you're stretching your arm. Okay. <laughs> Anybody on Zoom? Yes. Ankita. Oh, oh you need to be muted. Okay. Yeah. So competition? Ambition, competitiveness. <laughs> yeah, not these are all really interesting <laughs> questions. Not quite. Jenny. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. No. Forgiveness. Yeah. It's actually attachment. Uh, attachment. So we define attachment. These are all great guesses. And like I said, some of their answers, bookmark those answers for 2.15 this afternoon. So we say attachment, we define in Buddhism as experiencing an object as pleasant, exaggerating the pleasant qualities of the object, and then thinking that by retaining and possessing the object, we'll have lasting happiness. Set up for what? 
sex. Serious disappointment. Yeah, Tara, it's like suffering. Yep. Right? So when we have attachment to people, right, our loving kindness practice, if it's pure loving kindness, it's not, I mean, pure, 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 pure isn't mixed with attachment at all. For most of us in our close relationships, usually a mixture. We may truly wish others to have happiness and really need them in our lives to make us happy too, which is what attachment is. Like, I want you around. I'm going to cling on to your ankles. Like, please don't leave because you are the source of my happiness. And we say attachment is mixed with this ignorant view that the source of our happiness is external like Sarah was mentioning with the question of like how can I be happy if people around me aren't when mm -hmm. attachment says how can I be happy if that if that person who makes me happy isn't around I'm going to be miserable I always think of this story and some of you a lot of people like Anna and Marcella have probably heard this story a hundred times I apologize in advance for telling it again but it's such a beautiful like explanation of the difference between loving kindness and attachment so many years ago one of my teachers Lama Sopa Rinpoche was at a center where I was the center director and a student there was a big teaching and students were asking for appointments and so this one student came and he needed an appointment because he was really suffering because his wife had run off with his best friend right so double betrayal ouch yikes so he wants to talk to Lama Zopa and I'm like are you sure you really want to have this conversation so he was sure that he did and I'm kind of looking out for him and he had goes and has the conversation and comes back looking really confused and bewildered and I was like so how to go <laughs> and so he goes to someone who's been a monk his entire life and never had an intimate relationship and says this story, and Lama goes, oh, that's wonderful. He goes, you enjoyed her for 20 years, and now your best friend is enjoying her. She's enjoying him. And this, these are the two people you love the most in the world, and they're so happy together. Aren't you happy? And this guy's like, uh not quite there yet right so that kind of yeah I don't he's probably still not over it that was like 20 years ago he's probably still you know it's like I kind of felt like told you so thought that wouldn't go as well as you you wanted sympathy and mama so was like that's awesome they're so happy aren't you happy because loving kindness that wants other beings to be happy right and then the attachment piece is but it still kind of needs to be about us right and so just being aware of that if our loving kindness practice is partial and dependent on the other person sticking around for us for our happiness and it's hard it's hard you know it's really really hard to have love for others that's not mixed with wanting them to kind of stick around and be something that will make us happy too you know but that's seen as the near enemy so we try and correct our loving kindness practice for attachment that's the near enemy and we might think that we're you know, really extending loving kindness where we're just really deepening our attachment. So for each of these, we're going to have a near enemy and a far enemy. And so we need to really correct in our practice. And so compassion, the definition of compassion, as I mentioned, is the wish for beings to be free from suffering. So instead of the vision of their flourishing, and we can do both practices simultaneously, but when we're kind of conceptually dividing the two we say that compassion is the wish for beings to be free from suffering and for that we need to attune to the suffering so we say that our compassion practice is based first on empathy we talk about empathy a little bit before an empathic attunement so that we're aware of the experience of another and aware that the other is having some suffering, which sometimes can be quite overwhelming. So for a lot of people, compassion actually can be challenging 
It's, it's interesting. There's been some research done showing that when we feel that kind of overwhelm, some researchers say it's not compassion burnout, like there's a lot of articles now on compassion burnout. Some researchers on emotions and compassion and empathy say there's no such thing as compassion burnout, because compassion actually protects us from overwhelm. What we're really experiencing is empathic distress. So often the distress that comes from an attunement of the suffering and a feeling of helplessness, we don't know what to do. So actually learning compassion meditation, even in our imagination, freeing the others from suffering activates parts of our brain as if we were taking an action to eliminate their suffering, which helps protect us from that overwhelm and burnout. And it's really interesting. So even if we imagine easing the suffering in our imagination, it helps activate parts of the brain that save us from that empathic distress. It's when we attune to the suffering and feel helpless, there's nothing I can do. That's kind of the recipe for overwhelm and burnout. There was a study done many years ago, I often mention, and it was researchers researching PTSD. And there was a natural disaster, I think it was somewhere in Missouri, a big flood, and a lot of people died from a flood. And some of the survivors had PTSD and some of them didn't. And these researchers tried to determine what's the difference? What protects people? They both experience the same tragedy, but how come some of them have PTSD and some don't? They found the people who had PTSD would be standing at the bank of a river, watching the people you know, being swept down and felt helpless, there was nothing they could do. The people who didn't have PTSD had tried to at least throw in the log or the rope. And even if they didn't succeed, they did some action to try and help. Isn't that interesting? It wasn't about how many people were saved. It was about, did I feel that I did something to try? So that's why even our visualization, and more and more of this is being really supported in the research, even our visualization of helping helps protect us, is helps build up our resilience, is resourcing for us. Some people, when I do the compassion training, I do this eight-week compassion training that was developed at Stanford, and sometimes the first day of class, I do what I did with you all, why are you here? And a lot of people go, I'm here, but I'm really scared because if I become more compassionate, I'll become more overwhelmed. But it's actually the reverse. If we learn how to have a compassionate response, it actually protects from overwhelm. Yeah, Jorge. Oh, so one side. Oh, grab the mic so that the Zoom people can hear. Um, okay, so uh, what you were describing right now with um, with people that help, feel helpless, and there's another word that I, I use, uh, yeah. powerless, yeah. which is a big uh, trigger for me to go do uh, destructive things. Mm. Um, so like um, I had a discussion uh, with you uh, a while back about work, yeah. how I felt powerless when I got betrayed and this and that. Yeah, yeah. And there was like a lot of thoughts racing through my mind. It's not, not that I acted out on them. But um, so how would I use, uh, do something about that? Because it's not exactly physical. It's just like, yeah, it's all, yeah. um, you know, these interpersonal conflicts with uh, my coworkers. Yeah, yeah. How, how would I take action? I mean, I spoke my mind, uh, perhaps not in the most skillful way, but I did speak. <laughs> and uh, yeah. so, I, but I still feel powerless at the end of the day. Yeah, and so for this, studies have shown, and you know, 2,600 years of practice show also, even visualizing, even if we don't have the ability, even if it wouldn't be appropriate in the moment to act on our visualization, but visualizing, relieving the suffering of the other person, giving them something that would make them happy. Even if we just do it in our meditation, because we don't always have the capacity to do it, we may not be the appropriate person to actually interact with that person. It may be time, maybe the person is asked, asked for space and asked for some sort of boundary, so we don't wanna also invade. For all kinds of reasons, right, we may not 
actually interact with the person, but we can always imagine giving them happiness and taking away their suffering, right? And like we were talking before about the impact, I have another story that some of you have heard me say, my ex-sister-in-law, that this whole thing happened with my family, this big rift in my family, and she was kind of my nemesis for like over a decade. But when I started doing these practices, it's like, if I'm going to overcome my aversion to this person, I hadn't been in touch with her for years and years and years at this point, like 15 years. I started doing these practices really sincerely, imagining giving her happiness, relieving her suffering. And then I get a letter in the mail from her after like 16 years. And then after I talked to her, I was in a meditation retreat and I talked to her after the retreat going, where did that even come from? She's like, I don't know. Somehow you just came up really strongly. And I realized I needed to apologize for that thing that happened. So never underestimating even the power of our own mental transformation, even if it feels like we're not doing anything externally, we can always, and it's like in that situation, I mean, I remember saying to you, don't let them give them the power to take away your kindness. Like we can always respond with kindness and compassion in the situation and not letting even the, you know, even the hardest thing. And, that, and it's really hard and it may take us a while to even be willing to do that, but that's where the power comes from. Like our empowerment to even wish and visualize and extend, nobody can ever take that away from us no matter how they treat us, right? And so that, and it may change enough of the dynamic that then when it, when it's appropriate, when we have the ability, when we have the skills, when they're open to it, we might be able to actually heal, you know, the situation. But even if we don't heal it, it heals us and builds up our resilience and our capacity to do those practices. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Awesome. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any other any other questions about about that? Yeah. So I was thinking that sometimes the loving kindness and compassion can be looked as a weakness, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. And um, and I was just thinking about what his case in that actually, yeah, it's tough, right? Yeah. But in a way. You could say that, as you were saying, empowering. Yeah. So it's kind of like you raise your level yeah. of consciousness, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah. okay, you're an ass, whatever. <laughs> but, you know, like she says, I'm not going to let you drag me down. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so with um, the compassion and the loving kindness, then it becomes a strength, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Try to actually redeem yourself to redeem mm. your mind and not yeah. have it fall yeah. into that negative space. Yeah. But it's not, e it's not so easy. No, you know, at not, all. It's like the forgiveness. You're not going to be done by four o'clock this after. I should have right. said that in the very beginning. Just spoiler alert. You're not yeah. going to be fully fledged masters of the four. Right. But when you look at people who have really suffered, like some of the llamas, yeah. that they were in prison for 20 years. They were starved. They were beaten. You know, all these things. And then, and of course, still respond. the whole yeah. the Dalai Lama lost his country. Yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, that must have been... I mean, the suffering must be yeah. out of this world. Yet he's somehow, yeah, yeah, found strength, right? In yeah, coming that suffering and all these positive things that have come out of that it. That have come out of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't like what you know. I'm I'm so glad that you mentioned the idea of weakness. One thing that's so important to understand, especially about compassion, is it doesn't mean you're being a doormat and letting other people do whatever they want. We have appropriate boundaries about others' behavior and sometimes also speaking out very unambiguously about somebody's harmful behavior while holding compassion for them. And that's the hard part because sometimes we think, oh, if I'm compassionate, it means I give people a pass on all of their harmful behavior. Mostly the most compassionate thing you can do for someone else who's engaging in harm out of compassion for them and the karmic causes they're creating is do whatever you can to stop them doing harm. 
you know, you're doing, you're, you have compassion for the objects of their harmful actions, but also compassion for the person who's harming too, you know, and then that out of that deep compassion, acting in a way that might even be what we call in Buddhism wrathful, pretty intense to stop harm, but you're not doing it out of hatred towards the person. You're doing it out of compassion. So sometimes acting in ways that are pretty intense, but driven by compassion instead of anger and hatred and blaming. And that's really tricky, like finding, you know, how can I you know, do something to intervene and prevent harm for compassion for everybody in the situation, not just saving the helpless victim from the monster, right? Because nobody's a monster. We're all just, and, and that's one idea in Buddhism that actually I love and inform so much around this conversation. In Buddhism, we don't have a dichotomy of good and evil like a lot of other spiritual traditions. The dichotomy for us is ignorance and wisdom. So if somebody's acting in harmful ways, we say they're deeply ignorant about the causes of happiness and suffering. So how can your heart not go out to someone acting in harmful ways out of such deep ignorance but that's the hard part that's the hard part but again over practice over many many decades finding that easier and easier for me like when someone's doing harm thinking of the impact on them doing whatever i can to stop the harm whether it's marching in the street or jumping in you know in between or whatever but not hardening my heart towards the harm doer and seeing that they're subject to ignorance and not evil right but it's being really clear about boundaries is often the most compassionate thing and we say in buddhism we balance compassion and wisdom and so a lot of our teachers like lami eshi our lineage teacher used to talk about idiot compassion and that's the doormat kind that's the oh do whatever you want because i'm compassionate go ahead you know do your thing and he goes, there's no wisdom in that at all. So we've got to bring wisdom to bear, too. Yeah. Yes, Ankita, you've got your hand up. Yeah, so I've been struggling with something. Would you say competition, growth, ambition are all negative uh, vibrations? The reason I asked is, so when I when I do the, these kind of meditations, like practicing love, compassion for other people, I can feel that I'm getting happier. Like I know that uh, you think good for others, you feel good in yourself, right? So that makes yeah. me happy for sure. I can feel it, but we all live in a physical real world and yeah. uh, maybe at work or, you know, different situations, there are different times when you get competitive or maybe you're wired a certain way. So how, how do you overcome that? Is that necessarily an evil thought or... Yeah, yeah. You know, that's something I'm like not able to fit in the whole uh, framework, if that makes sense. You know, I think often like I teach these workshops in conflict management skills, and we talk about different ways of approaching conflict. And a lot of people feel like competition is their default mode. And then the best possible outcome is compromise so each party gets 50 percent of what they want they're like oh i don't want to be competitive and win 100 percent but you know so i'll give half and the other so we each kind of 50 percent get our needs met we have a model of collaboration which isn't based on like the zero sum model of like there's finite amount of resources and we're competing for that finite amount and it says it can be a win-win situation that with collaboration and with creativity, maybe even in a workplace situation, you don't have to squash all your ambition, but can you also think outside the box and think, how can I be ambitious and the other person ambitious and we can maybe collaborate on something even beyond what either one of us would have thought was like winning you know, in that situation. So I just encourage thinking that way, like collaboration, which takes creativity and curiosity and really not thinking that everything has to have a winner and a loser, that with collaboration, you can come up with even more than the 100% you were trying to divide in half thinking you were being a good person. You can actually come up with something that's even better for both parties. So again, situation specific, but I think often in 
you know, capitalist competitive culture, we're so trained to think it's this dog eat dog kind of world. And I have to look out for number one and survival of the fittest. And I don't know, you know, I think we've got to think beyond that. And I don't think it's even just true. So much evolutionary psychology is saying actually cooperation and collaboration is more of our default way of functioning and survival, this kind of myth that I think the corporate world and the business world is still like operating under this very outmoded model. And I think we can be kind of compassionate warriors and really speak out and like lift up some of these alternative ways of looking at things. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Let's see before <clears throat> what I want to do, because I want to kind of respect the time and we won't be able to get into a meditation. I'm going to share my screen for just a minute because there's two slides that kind of illustrate what I've been talking about in terms of this empathic distress and the compassion burnout. And then what we'll do after our lunch break is go straight into a compassion meditation and then talk about self-compassion a little bit. And then ha we'll have time for our small groups to discuss a little bit, but let me share my screen. So, yeah, I hope I have this. Oh, never mind. I do not have the slide that I was hoping for. <laughs> Sorry about that. I didn't have that slide. Maybe what I'll do during the lunch break, I'll get the slide, but it's just showing how some research by Tanya Singer, who's a, a researcher at the Max Planck Institute in Germany, and she's done research kind of showing this pathway from empathy, one pathway leading to empathic distress and overwhelm, which actually makes us withdraw from the situation instead of engaging. We say instead of a pro-social motivation, one pathway is empathy going to compassion and then an approach motivation, pro-social actions, actually leading to good health. There's physiological correlates to compassion that actually support our health, whereas the empathic distress, you know, stress hormones, increase in cortisol, blood pressure, and all of these things that lead to poor health. So these two different pathways. So the more we strengthen the compassion pathway, the more resilience we have, the more resourcing and better health outcomes. And then we can stay present in the face of suffering, even when we can't do anything about it. I have a friend two weeks ago, when right the day after the Hamas kidnappings and all, you know, all of the things that happened and a friend of mine who's Jewish and has lived in Israel a lot, you know, and we were spending time together and he was like really distressed and some of his relatives there and he didn't know if everybody was okay yet. And he just wanted to get on a plane and go. And he goes, I know it's crazy, but I just want to get on a plane and go. So it's sort of the wisdom said, no, that's not actually going to help. It's just going to in interfere to actually have one more American citizen kind of in there. And, you know, there's nothing he could do. But even just that wish to be of benefit and wish to go, you know, and we imagine acting in some way that's going to be helpful, right? Even if we don't have the capacity, you know, we're not medical personnel. There's nothing we can actually do to help in a certain situation, but we can always bring it into our practice. So really keeping that in mind. And so what we'll do, we'll have a break for an hour. Hopefully an hour is enough time. There's so many places to eat right on this block. I figured an hour is enough time to get something and come back. Then we'll do compassion meditation, which will be similar to the loving kindness one that we did before in the concentric circles. And then we'll explore a little bit about self-compassion and talk about that a little bit in small groups, and then finish off the day with empathic joy and equanimity. There's a beautiful meditation for empathic joy. And it was many years of my involvement in Tibetan Buddhist practice before I actually was introduced to, to a meditation on it. We were just told to have it. Like when other people are happy, just be happy for their happiness. Just do it. It was like, okay, not so easy. And then actually the meditation teacher, Alan Wallace, introduced me to this beautiful meditation where we can take empathetic joy into our practice. So that's the 
that's the kind of idea for the afternoon. So enjoy your lunch and I'll see you back here in an hour. And okay, so what we're gonna do first, even though it's very dangerous right after lunch, but hopefully we'll make it through, is <laughs> do our meditation on compassion. And then we'll talk about one of the interesting things with compassion is sometimes there can be obstacles to compassion. And there's some research that have been done on some of the obstacles to compassion. And so I'll present a little bit of that. And then that'll be kind of the prompt for our breakout rooms. We'll just have about 10 minutes in small groups to talk about you know, what is sometimes challenging about compassion, the idea of compassion, compassion practice. As I said, sometimes when I do the compassion trainings, people are like, oh, I think this would be good for me and I'm scared because I just feel like I'm setting myself up to being even more overwhelmed than I already am by increasing my compassion, you know, so things like that. So we'll talk about that. But first, let's do our practice. And what we'll do with this practice is similar to the loving kindness, we'll work with kind of the standard idea of starting with the loved one and then extending our compassion out. So very similar to what we did with the loving kindness. And it's interesting to just notice the different flavor of compassion and that wish to remove the suffering. For some people, they find loving kindness kind of easier and more of a kind of easy go-to. For some people, compassion seems to come more naturally and is easier. So just noticing as you do the practice, it's interesting to see, oh, the other one was easier, or this one seems easier, whatever comes up for you. So I'll invite you to get into your comfortable posture with your back straight and your shoulders even. <laughs> your hands can be resting on your knees or resting in your lap. And your eyes either closed or in that hooded gaze. And then again, just sweeping through the body. I won't guide you through the whole body scan, but just sweeping through the body briefly to just to see if there's any tightness or tension or constriction and then just deliberately relaxing, releasing. I'm just releasing any distracting thoughts. If you notice you're being pulled away from the sensations of the breath, just return to the sensations of the breath wherever you can feel them most easily in your body. Just over and over, releasing and returning, getting yourself into the present moment, into your body. And so before we move into compassion, we'll experience loving kindness for a loved one as we did in the last practice. And so first of all, thinking of someone close to you, someone for whom you feel a great amount of love and care and closeness and warmth. And you can either visualize them seated in front of you if it's easy to get a visual image or get a felt sense of their presence. And as their visual image or their felt sense becomes more real, just noticing what feelings you feel for the loved one. 
You might feel a feeling of warmth around your heart or openness or some sensation. And as you breathe out, imagine you're extending a warm, bright light from your heart that holds all of your warm feelings towards your loved one. And imagine that this warm light reaches out to them, bringing them peace and happiness. And in addition to the visualization, we can also recite some phrases May you have happiness. May you experience joy and ease. May you have happiness. May you experience joy and ease. With each out breath, sending that warm light. It reaches to your loved one, bringing them happiness. May you have happiness. May you experience joy and ease. May you have happiness. May you experience joy and ease. And now thinking of this loved one, it could be a friend, it could be a relative, someone you care about, someone you're close to. And think of a time that they might have experienced some unwanted experience, some kind of suffering, perhaps an illness, perhaps problems in a relationship, perhaps some other physical or emotional or mental difficulty, sometime that they really experienced something that was challenging and difficult. Draw from your memory. Remembering that experience, how they felt, and then how you felt or how you feel now, bringing this to mind. There might be a natural wish to relieve them from their suffering, a wish to do something, to reach out. When the reality of their suffering comes clearly to mind. Notice how it feels. Notice what your natural inclination is. And then continuing to visualize your loved one, as you breathe and imagine with each out breath, you're extending that warm light. And this time the warm light eases that person's suffering. With each exhalation, with that strong heartfelt wish that they be free from the suffering. And you can also use the phrases, may you be free from this suffering. May you have joy and ease. May you be free from this suffering. May you have joy and ease as you send this light out with each out breath.
May you be free from this suffering. May you have joy and ease. And noticing how that feels in your heart as you're extending that compassionate wish with each out breath and with the phrases. And then allowing that visualization of the loved one to dissolve back into the space of your mind. And now bringing to mind a time where you yourself suffered or experienced some challenge, some difficulty. Maybe you experienced a conflict with someone that you care about or you didn't succeed in something that you wanted or maybe you experienced some physical illness or some emotional distress or challenge. So bring to mind, again, drawing from memory, a time when you experienced challenging circumstances And just as we wish for our loved one's suffering to end, we also wish that our own suffering would end. And so again, as you breathe, with each out breath, imagining this bright light emanating from your heart, and this time filling your whole body, easing your suffering. It's natural, it's worthy that we wish for our own suffering to cease as well. We too, suffering sentient beings, just like all other beings. So sending that warm light out from your heart with each out breath, imagine it filling your body and easing your suffering. As you recite, may I be free from this suffering. May I experience joy and ease. May I be free from this suffering. May I experience joy and ease. With each out breath, filling your whole body, easing your suffering with that same care and concern for yourself that you had for your loved one. May I be free from this suffering. May I experience joy and ease. And now visualize someone that you neither like nor dislike. 
but a real person, someone you might see in your daily life, it might be a coworker you don't know very well, you don't have any feelings towards them one way or another, or someone who works in a shop that you go to frequently that you recognize, maybe your local barista, maybe someone you pass on the street, Someone specific, but someone for whom you have neither feelings of affection or any feelings of aversion in any way. So bring someone specific to mind. And even though you don't know anything about this person, you don't really know about their life, but just because they're a human being, you know that there are times they experience suffering in their own lives. They too have conflicts with loved ones, may struggle, maybe with addiction or some emotional difficulties, maybe with some sort of physical illness. But just knowing that this person too, even though you don't know any details about their life, but definitely goes through unwanted experiences and challenges. And as a human being, their suffering is just as important to them as yours is to you as your best friends is to them. And again, with every out breath, visualizing this warm light going out to this stranger, extending the light out, imagine, as it reaches them, it eases their suffering. May you be free from the suffering. May you have joy and ease with every out breath. May you be free from the suffering. May you have joy and ease. May you be free from the suffering. May you have joy and ease. And just notice how this feels as you send this compassion out to the stranger. Does it feel less? Then for the loved one and yourself or the same, just noticing as you continue to breathe out this energy of compassion. May you be free from suffering. May you experience joy and ease. And then allow the visualization of that stranger to dissolve back into the space of your mind. And now think of someone you have difficulty with in your life. It could be an ex-partner or maybe a coworker that you disagree with and don't get along with maybe even a teenage child you're struggling with right now, someone you're having some difficulty with in your life or somebody you just find annoying or irritating. And 
And even though you have feelings towards this person that are difficult, that are not so warm, not so close, imagine that from their side, in their human experience, they go through exactly the same challenges that we all do, that you do, that your loved ones do. They also experience conflicts in their relationships. They're at times disappointed, feel sadness, feel a sense of failure, also sometimes physical illness and other difficulties. And so imagine from that person's side, putting yourself in their shoes, what they're going through when they're experiencing struggles. And then see if you can also send out that warm light from your heart, even to this difficult person, realizing that common humanity, that they too struggle as we all do. And with each out breath, sending out that warm light and the wishes, may you be free from, from suffering and may you experience joy and ease. May you too be free from suffering. And may you experience joy and ease. Beach out breath, sending out that compassionate wish even to this difficult person. May you too be free from this suffering. May you experience joy and ease. And then let's take a few moments to just imagine expanding and extending this compassionate wish to all beings. So sending that bright light out from your heart in all directions, that light touching all beings, all equal in wanting happiness, wanting freedom from suffering. There's no difference at all. all beings wishing for relief. So sending that compassionate wish, may all beings be free from suffering. May all beings experience joy and ease. May all beings be free from suffering. May all beings experience joy and ease. Taking a moment to relax and gently come out of meditation. Wow. 
Okay, so any questions or comments or reflections on that practice? Anything that you noticed with that one? Yeah, Anna, oops, let's get the mic. So sometimes it was difficult to pick a person. Yeah. And so then maybe two people <laughs> here. And I was going to ask if, um, is there actually a difference between doing maybe the one person or two people? Yeah, the only danger people. is making it too generic. So it's just like generic category of friend or generic category of stranger. And then there's nobody that you really, it doesn't invoke a feeling. I mean, I think if you pick two specific people, but usually picking one makes it more of a felt sense because even with two people we might have difficulty with, it might be different slightly between the two and then you're kind of going back and forth like we hardly ever feel exactly the same towards any two people. <laughs> you know, so that's the thing, like the danger is it becomes, too, it weakens it if it's too generic. So even with the stranger, like a, like the barista or the person, you know, not just like, oh, stranger, there's all these people right now walking down the street. We don't even know who they are, like still the specificity of it. But yeah, so I would tend to suggest picking one for that rather than a category because it becomes too general. Yeah, great question. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? All right. So I have a question for you. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I, it's interesting. I, I could feel my, my mind's temptation to jump ahead to the, the, the priming, um, which I experienced is very valuable in this morning's meditation. In this one, I felt my my brain was like, I want to jump right to the harder one. <laughs> but it wasn't, I, I, and then I got distracted trying to figure out why. But at that point, I had distracted myself with trying to mm. to do that. And at that end, kind of scrambled my, yeah, yeah. my feelings. Because then I felt like I couldn't come back. You know, I was like, oh, this is the difficult person. But now I'm trying to come back to the easier yeah, one. Yeah, back I can't. to the easier one. Yeah. And, and we, you know, it. it's not uncommon. I mean, like I said before, sometimes when I do this eight week compassion, the very first week, people are like, wait, but what about Donald Trump? And I'm like, pump the brakes, dial it back. Well, one step at a time, you know, and I think sometimes it's our enthusiasm to really succeed too of like, oh, if I pick the hard one and if it works, then I'm sweet, I'm done, you know, and it's sort of a funny um conundrum of like we have these high aspirations but we have the have to also hold the humility of like no i really do have to do it one step at a time and not jump too far ahead of myself because i think sometimes when we do that then we can't and then we have a feeling of of failure whereas if we really do build up even just one tiny increment at a time and it might feel like it's going too slow but we're so used to that kind of instant gratification and just kind of going all the way to the end quickly. So it may be that it may also be that it's after lunch and you were sleepier and just wanted to be over with quicker too, which is also understandable. But I think sometimes we have these high aspirations, but kind of trusting the practice and the incremental nature and deepening is kind of like what Claudia was saying, like the difference between the head and the heart. Like we can think we f understand it and feel why it's important to be compassionate to even the difficult person, but our heart's still like, Arr. you know, and so really letting it drop in slowly so that that transformation gets really, you know, deep in there. I don't know if any of that helps. Well, yeah. So as, as you're speaking, I'm also realizing how much it is definitely coming from the party. It's like, I'm going to use this to solve the problem as opposed to doing it for its own sake. Yeah, right, right. I mean, oh my gosh, right? What you just said, like the thing of like, I want the problem to go away quick, compassion, and then the annoying people will disappear. 
like the more compassionate I am, then they'll just go away or I'll have solved how irritating they are because I'll have substituted irritation. <laughs> also very natural, sort of missing the point. But <laughs> then it's so self-focused of like, oh, I want to have compassion just so everybody won't be so irritating anymore. <laughs> so it's kind of like, I really want to open my heart. Can anybody relate to that motivation? I like to, right? we all kind of feel that way but it's a good start and not to feel like i mean it's kind of like what i said the difference between loving kindness and attachment don't expect overnight for your intimate relationships to be purified of attachment like it will be that way like it's going to be mixed and our motivations for all these things are going to be mixed for a long time so we do want to be compassionate. We also do wish not to be so irritated by people. And both of those things can coexist for a really long time. I remember when I first started studying Tibetan Buddhism, it was such a relief when one of my Tibetan lamas said, and this is way back in like the mid 90s or something, and he said, you have to be at such a high level of spiritual realization for your intentions not to be mixed with like self-absorption. And I was like, oh, thank God. Right. And no selfish motivation at all. Because I was kept trying like, come on, get your motivation pure. What's wrong with you? And then it was like, oh, I'm not in line yet. Duh. Big surprise. But, you know, when he said he kind of normalized, oh, they'll be mixed. Like you will have this real altruism and this real beautiful aspirational thing and it'll still mostly be about you for a very long time. And just kind of accepting the mixed bagness of that, it was a relief. So, oh, <laughs> oh thank you. That, that may be the takeaway from today for everybody. It's okay if we're self-absorbed. We're going to be for a really long time. <laughs> I won't even say in the 10 Bodhisattva Bhumis when that happens. I do remember what he said but that's a whole nother story so yeah yeah yes gnome i see your hand yeah hi thank you um i mean that kind of i think applies to all the immeasurables that we want to practice them without uh expectation of a reward or some kind of fruition again not that that's easy but it <laughs> It, because it really otherwise it's transactional you know and it's not meant to be transactional it's meant to be uh what like um i don't know i guess yeah i like a a, a a a state that we are in rather than a thing that we are doing yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're mostly still mostly motivated by relieving ourselves of our own suffering, not just in future lives, like by next Tuesday, you know, so that too, like we, you know, we say in Buddhism, oh, I shouldn't even be attached to the pleasures of this life at all. I should just be thinking of future lives and then I'm, oh, well, yeah, go see how that works out for you. You know, mostly we want kind of immediate relief and if we at least have this aspirational level, even that willingness of that aspirational level, and that's really good as a beginning. And it's more like they always say, any rung up the ladder you are from ground level is a plus, right? Mm -hmm. And so not feeling like we need to jump right to the start of the, the top of the ladder, which you can't do by climbing up every rung. So it's like you stay at rung number one for a while, and then you go up to rung number two, and then like I keep saying, like trusting the practice. When one Tibetan Lama talked to Tulku Rinpoche, who had places in California, also taught a lot in Brazil, passed away a number of years ago. And he had this wonderful like metaphor for practice. And he said, it's like pouring your mind through a filter over and over and over again. And it filters out more and more of the impurities like every time you meditate and i just love that as like a metaphor analogy or whatever it is of like the practice is a filter and you just keep filtering keep filtering and keep trusting that filtering process and it takes a while to get all the impurities out yeah 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 cage um yeah i was just um noticing that 
the difference between the loving kindness and the compassion practice oh. really stood out for yeah. me today. I was like, with the this morning with the loving kindness, there was sort of a lot of joy mm. um, and lightness, and just like, you know, let me yeah. do this for you. And of course, I wish you happiness. Um, but then with the compassion one, it really, I really felt the difference today of like the pain that the other, yeah. you know, my, you know, I was doing it for my son and yeah. just like some pain that he's had at school or relationships mm -hmm. and uh, just different yeah. family members. And yeah. it really was like a different feel, like let me yeah. take that pain away. Yeah. And I'm so sorry you have that to deal with that pain. Yeah. Then just being like, oh, I wish you happiness. And ice cream cones and yes, unicorns and, good, and rainbows. And yeah. good, well, like this one was more like, oh, you do, I do see the pain. That yeah, you're that's in. right. And it's, yeah. It was a little more tender, mm. um, I think, than the, just the expressive joy of the that's right and that's it time. because with that it requires a attunement to suffering which is yeah which is tender when it's people we care about obviously or anybody but it is it's that part of the challenging person yeah <laughs> 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 what do I just say? I have to because Tenzin Jogi said to so, us, yeah. yeah, yeah, but that that can be like just the felt sense of how much easier it can feel to just be thinking about like all the yummy, positive, fun stuff for someone versus attuning to the suffering which we need to do for the sincere compassion yeah and that's why in so many practices we kind of do both in the same practice sometimes too like the tonglen that Anna was talking about like we do the giving and the taking because then it kind of balances that out a little bit we're not just only kind of attuning to the suffering so we kind of learn them in these phases and often we can do the practices and have both towards the same object which helps kind of balance out the felt sense of that a little bit too yeah yeah honey you hit your hand up yeah, yeah. I just wanted to talk a little bit more about I was just thinking about like the near enemy um, of the first one you know uh, attachment and I can see how you can be attached to someone and, and almost kind of like dragging them down like and not letting them grow in their own way and stuff but then I was also thinking like if you really care about someone you know when you and Eve talked about this the other day but wouldn't you be really sad if you didn't feel sad when they died you know if you didn't like so I'm just wondering if you talk a little bit more about maybe maybe what you mean by attachment and yeah yeah well it's it's in a way you know the Buddhist said you know that so much of our suffering comes from thinking that our happiness and suffering are caused by external things people and events you know so it's the ignorance of the attachment the piece that says I need you for my happiness. I'll never be happy without you. I, you are, and then also the exaggeration of only seeing the positive qualities, which means you're not seeing the mixed bag. And I would say like anybody ever fallen in love and the person's perfect for at least two weeks, sometimes like a couple of months, if you're lucky. And then suddenly like they're leaving the toilet seat up in the middle of the night and you fall in. And then you're like, you're not the person I fell in love with. Well, no, because you fell in love with your projection of perfection, mostly. And understanding that people are, you know, mixed is part of the realistic scene that attachment is like, ooh, shiny, perfect, wonderful, everything, which usually leads to a fall. So it's like, that being in there, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't love people. And it, of course, doesn't mean that we don't feel the loss when someone we love passes away. You know, even many of my teachers have lost their parents and their relatives and so forth and definitely feel grief. But it's not this mixed thing. I mean, I remember when my mother died when I was quite young, and I literally thought I'd never be happy. I thought I'd never laugh again. Like it felt so much like this person is gone. I will never be happy again. And I remember the first time I laughed, I noticed the first time I laughed and I felt like I betrayed her memory or something. 
So that thing, the exaggeration piece, right? Rather than like, of course, we miss the relationship with people who are important to us when they leave us or move across country or die or whatever it may be. But it's the exaggerated, oh, I'll never be happy again piece, right? So thinking of the exaggeration and thinking of how much of our expectation of happiness is external rather than realizing it's up to us in developing those qualities, right? Mm -hmm. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But attachment is a funny one because people... Pema Chodron, the great Buddhist teacher, Pema Chodron, I re remember once she gave a talk that I attended. She goes, I've had countless students come up to me and ask for an antidote to their anger. Not one has ever asked for an antidote to their attachment. Because we were fooled into thinking attachment brings us happiness. We don't want to get rid of our attachment. So it takes a lot of meditating on the difference between love and attachment, mm -hmm. you know, to get it right. And now we're like, no, I don't want to give up my attachment because then my life will just be bland and I won't care. Because for us, we're so fooled to thinking that it's the source of happiness and it's really what love is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. This is kind of a not super related question to the thread that we've been on, but um, something that came up in both practices and something that is kind of just in general too is I find it really hard to access hatred and mm. and anger and yeah. i think like there's an intellectualizing piece of just like fully like quickly just skipping over yeah. potential hurt and just yeah. like i see them as a whole person i see their trauma matrix you know like i yeah. i want to just go right to the forgiveness um and the compassion practices and so it's it's it feels like hard for me to stay or even access like a level of of hatred or or right. agitation or irritation or even irritation yeah you know i wonder i mean i just i know you know for me it was very gendered and it was also family like sadness and anger were not allowed to be experienced or definitely not expressed at all in my family of origin. And I even fooled myself for a long time into thinking, oh, I don't feel sadness and anger at all, right? And then I went into a long meditation retreat and suddenly like 45 years of sadness and anger that had been suppressed, exploded. It was a mess. <laughs> Luckily, I was in a yurt in the middle of the desert by myself. <laughs> my journal bore the brunt of my experience. But, you know, it's there's a difference. I mean, it may be that you truly don't feel, you know, the, the anger and that you do feel compassion. And I noticed for myself anyway, I had kind of fooled myself with my skilled suppression into thinking that I didn't experience that. But it was only in being able to experience the sadness and anger was I'd be able, able to really transform that energy into something positive. So it's kind of interesting. And like, I really believed I wasn't, I mean, I had fooled myself, but I believed how much I fooled myself into thinking I really didn't feel those emotions, you know? So it can be that a little bit too, I think, especially like with gender norms in our culture and things like that. It's not very ladylike to be angry. I mean, look at what happened to Hillary Clinton. You know, whereas all these things that she expressed, and if it had been a man, we would have had a different precedent, you know, but are not are seen completely differently through those lenses. And anger is like the function of anger is to show us when there's an obstacle to us achieving some goal. So if we understand that, we can easily transform it. It doesn't have to kind of become concretized into hatred for sure. Like we can have that moment of like, oh, a boundary is being violated or something's happening. We can have that burst, but then we know exactly what to do. And as Paul Ekman and the Dalai Lama and so many spiritual teachers say, anger can be either constructive or destructive. Hatred is always destructive. Now I think of hatred as kind of solidified anger or like concretized anger in a way. So that's never beneficial. But anger just shows us kind of what we need and that something we need is not happening. So yeah, so it gets interesting, like playing with, with those, those dynamics. Yeah. 
Yeah. I wanted to build on this because I, I felt very similar things at many times in my life. And spiritual practice often, it's very interesting because I can feel these things sometimes during practice. But practice always seems to be very much about kind of this this calmness and this centeredness and even journaling i yeah have a friend who cured her chronic migraines through anger journaling yeah but i find the act of journaling to be like i can't be angry when i'm like writing like, yeah. it's, it's like, you know it's like i want to be doing something like big yeah know, yeah you know, right feeling the emotion and I, i'm very curious about how how does this kind of practice support those kinds of bigger emotions? Yeah. When it yeah. feels often it feels like so much of it is about it can feel a bit like suppression or yeah. 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 So the Buddha sit on your pillow and kind of and, and just inside. be cool and calm. Yeah. And this is a whole nother 42 hour class that <laughs> Eve and I teach together. <laughs> and the short answer is, I mean, the approach often that we take to emotions is either suppression or expression. You know, in the 80s, there's this whole thing or 70s primal screaming, like, don't yeah. don't suppress, for God's sake, or you get cancer. So you beat a pillow and scream or punch somebody in the face. Like, And Buddhism would say, no, it's not either one of those two extremes. So in Buddhism, we say awareness and then transformation. So awareness, because the emotions have a message for us. So without awareness, we're not getting the message. If we get the message, for example, of the anger, then we can easily transform that into getting our needs met if there's some obstacle in getting our need met. And then we don't, again, have to concretize into hatred and blaming of the person. But if somebody is annoying us, if we can be aware of that annoyance and go, oh, what are they blocking? Like they're blocking me getting something that I need. What are they blocking? How do I deal with that in a constructive way? And then we move through, right? And then, you know, because I think sometimes even journaling can just be re-triggering. Like we keep re-triggering by justifying, yeah, they're such a jerk. Oh my God, they did this thing and said this thing. And then it makes it even, even more firm. But if we can see, oh, that person is you know, kind of a factor in this anger arising, but the anger is really because my need isn't being met. So how do I solve that, right? So it's that transformation piece. Because I think some of the things that we do, even to feel it can just be re-triggering. Again, if we don't bring that wisdom to it and see what's the wise approach to this very natural emotion that I'm feeling and how can I transform it so I don't stay stuck in it, right? Mm -hmm. Hopefully that, I mean, like I said, that's like the paragraph of the 42 hour class that even I teach. <laughs> but that's kind of the approach. So, so awareness and transformation rather than the extremes of suppression and acting out, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I wanna ask you and then, oh, Marcel has got her hand up and then we'll, and then I've got a question for you all. Marcelita, por favor. Oh, Noam, can you unmute Marcella? I think she needs to be, oh, maybe I can. I do call it, I think you're covered. Does that work? Yeah. Here we go. Now? <laughs> yeah. Yes, um, you know, something that I experienced um, during many years, it's that I was feeling anger uh, as a child but I try to replace that with something that covers, like, uh, um, you know, instead of feeling anger, I was feeling, um, you know, uh, resent. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. I don't want to feel anger for what happened to, to us. And yeah. uh, but then uh, through Dharma and through the practice, little by little, I recognize that that, what that's what was happening because without the awareness as you said it's very difficult to understand what's next mm. what can i do to to develop and to uh realize what can i do and mm. it's, it's incredible because how sometimes uh i was replacing certain emotions that hurts me 
with something mm -hmm. that is a little less, but at the same time is not uh, helpful or is not beneficial, like yeah. the recent. And yeah. it, it took me a, a lot of time, a lot of years. And then yeah. um, I thought that I got it and then come back again. Because, <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know, it was, it was incredible because I thought that I already got it, but no, I didn't. And, yeah. uh, you know, it was the time and I could go through and, you know, and that it was, um, you know, the experience was a very, very amazing. And at the same time, uh, opened my eyes, you know, how can I transform things, different things, because, you know, it's not only one, and uh, but, but it's very, uh, very powerful, you know, if yeah. you through and yeah, I have, uh, you know, I feel very, very thankful for that and, and for all the teachings that um, through you, I got it. And yeah, yeah, it's just um, the resentment is, is, is not uh, helpful also. Yeah, it's right. And we say actually resentment is in the anger family of emotions. So we say like, it's more of like the smoldering, long lasting anger. It's like less intensity, but kind of lasts longer. So it's really in that same family. So not really so much of a transformation, you know, in, in, an, in a constructive way, but just sort of prolonging the anger at a much more low level. But like you say, it's such a process with some of our destructive emotions to, you know, and it takes time to, and we try one thing and we think it works and then we realize it's not exactly right. And then we keep trying something else until we get something that really helps with that transformation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. What I want to do, there's, uh, we're going to go into little groups for about 10 minutes. And what I want to do is talk a little bit about some of the obstacles to compassion and have you all talk about it. Because some of you may be aware of some of your hesitation or some of the things that are difficult about compassion. There's a researcher and also a psychotherapist called Paul Gilbert, who's based in the UK, and he developed a modality called Compassion Focused Therapy. And he's also a Buddhist practitioner and a researcher, and he's written some great books. He has a whole lot of stuff on like YouTube and on his website, if you just Google Paul Gilbert. And he did a research study where he talked about what he calls fears of compassion scales. And so instead of fears of compassion, I think of more my Buddhist language of obstacles to compassion. And he talked about obstacles to extending compassion to others, obstacles to receiving compassion from others, because that's a whole nother story, like how hard it is sometimes to receive compassion and obstacles to self-compassion. And so I want to just kind of go down the list of what he found in his research of our obstacles to extending or expressing compassion to others. And then I'll invite you into groups of about three and the people in the room, we can kind of just organize ourselves into little pods of three-ish. And for about 10 minutes, just discuss with your classmates what comes up for you. Can you relate to any of these? Do you have any that aren't on the list? Just talk a little bit about how hard compassion can be. And then we'll come back and share. And so our guideline for the small breakout rooms is confidentiality in the breakout room. So when we come back to discuss in the big group, just talk about your own experience. Don't say, Anna doesn't say, oh, Connie said to me that her obstacle to compassion is so-and-so. That's what not to do. <laughs> and so I'll read through, and these are just some typical things that came out in the research. And I'm going to read these statements and then pause for a minute and just kind of let it sink in and see if this is perhaps one of the obstacles to compassion that you might experience. People will take advantage of me if they see me as too compassionate. There are some people in life who don't deserve compassion.
I fear that being too compassionate makes people an easy target. I worry that if I am compassionate, vulnerable people can be drawn to me and drain my emotional resources. People need to help themselves rather than waiting for others to help them. For some people, I think discipline and proper punishments are more helpful than being compassionate to them. Okay. Yeah, um, people need to help themselves rather than waiting for others to help them. In our book, it's one of those that people with individual feel overwhelmed. It's there. There's one that says, um, "I worry that if I'm compassionate, vulnerable people can be drawn to me and drain my emotional resources." That one, yeah. Or your own, fill in the blank, right? These may not be, I mean, this comes from the research, okay. and there may be something else. This is just a prompt from the research, but there may be some other obstacle to compassion that you experience. So, so love to hear a couple of comments of what might have come up for you in terms of the obstacles or challenges to your compassion. Anybody would like to share from your own experience, either from the Zoom room or the room room? Any Anybody relate to that? Yeah, Cage? And the, yeah, and then Kay? I think the, uh, the main two scenes that I sort of remember was uh, from our group was the um, being vulnerable people will sort of drain me. Uh, you yeah. know, there's just too much suffering sometimes. And, you know, there's just, you sort of don't have the time and energy to hold it all. Like you can do some a little bit, but all of it, no just, way. And yeah. it can kind of shut down. And then I think another one that came up a lot was that uh, the, some people sort of need you know, discipline and punishments and maybe from like our family cultures, it was that sort of like kind of cruel, tough love yeah, kind of discipline, you know, or uh, you know, if somebody's life was going off track, then they need to sort of help themselves and we've done all we can. And there's just this layer of cruelty there mm. Um, mm. Yeah. that came up. Perhaps. That first one, sometimes when I'm doing this, and kind of longer workshops, I do a way of doing this where I have everybody stand in a circle and then take one step forward. If they can relate to any of these statements, like I'll read the statement and then have people just take a step forward and then a step back. And that one about people will drain me and overwhelm almost everyone. I mean, that's the one that over years and years I've been doing the exercise, the most people step into the circle for that one. So that's a really common, common one. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. And Kate, did you have your hand up? Thanks. But we have some good discussion and I, I hadn't linked something to attachment until that discussion. Uh, but I think for me, the biggest blocker for compassion is that I feel like every cause of suffering has a root that can be fixed. Ah. And compassion, meaning like sitting with the feeling of suffering and hoping that it goes away, feels like the opposite of fixing it. Ah, right, right, right. And that yeah. brings up anger for me instead of yeah. anything else. Uh, and so I think it's that my biggest blocker is this attachment to this idea that you can fix every problem yeah, yeah, and therefore yeah. not have suffering in the first place. Right, right. Yeah, super interesting. And, so, and what you say reminds me of, you know, a thing we often say about empathy 
and how helpful it can be to just be an empathic presence to someone who's going through something difficult. And often we do want to solve it and it just pisses them off. Like they really just want to be heard. Like whenever we're going, like we know what we're going to do when we're going through hard time and we just want someone to be there with us as we complain about it. And then when they try and solve it, you're like, you're not listening to me. Just listen. You know, so being on the receiving end and realizing how much just being with, you know, and having that empathic presence rather than scrambling to fix it. That's interesting that you connected that to the attachment piece that we were talking about. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Anybody on Zoom or anybody else in the room? Yeah. Connie's got something. Yeah. Um, I don't want to speak for a whole group, but it sort of fits in with what Kay was saying, I think, because we were asking, is compassion a feeling or an action? Because I think I was sort of thinking like you, that these you can solve these problems. We just have to get together and solve them. But maybe sometimes that isn't true. But I don't know. I don't want to speak for the whole group. But we sort of had that question that we wanted to ask. You know, compassion, one of the definitions we have of compassion starts with the empathy of understanding the suffering, having a feeling of care and concern for the suffering, then the third stage is wishing the suffering would be freed, you know, that the person would be freed. And then the fourth step is a motivation to do something, but you haven't done anything yet. So we can have fully fledged compassion without taking a actual physical altruistic action. Often compassion is a motivation for some altruistic action. But compassion itself, because at that point, you have a motivation to do something to help, but you may realize it's not the right time. I'm not the right person. This person wouldn't appreciate my, you know, any number of things. Like, how do you take wise, appropriate, altruistic action? That's a whole nother workshop. That's a whole nother, like, six weeks. But the compassion and the wish and the motivation can be there even without the action. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's like the prerequisite for some helpful altruistic action if it's appropriate and all the things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. Tara. That's one of the obstacles for me to compassion because then there's an obligation. Yeah. That's right. My heart. You know, yeah. Yeah. Don't do anything about it. Yeah. And like, there's guilt. Right. There's yeah, yeah, exactly. If we feel that, because then it feels like, oh, we have to start a new nonprofit. If we care, then the next step is a 501c3 to help the refugee. You know, it's like, yeah, totally. So realizing, I mean, I think two things, like realizing, oh, there's so much, not just two things, but two things I can think of is, yeah, the appropriateness of you as the actor and the wisdom that you bring to that. And even tiny, small things help. We think it needs to be so huge, we're immediately overwhelmed. I had a friend who is a Zen priest. He's probably still doing this. I haven't seen him in a while. A Zen priest, and during the AIDS, he lived here in San Francisco during the peak of the AIDS crisis, and he would just go to households to take care of people dying and just live with them and take care of them. And then they would pass and then he'd go to the next one. And he literally had two changes of clothes, black because then a Zafu that he carried in this big paper bag with handles, like all his worldly possessions. And I remember, you know, he's so stoked that he found a big paper bag that was strong with handles so he could carry everything in it. And I remember one time he said to me, he goes, it's so easy. He, somebody trips and falls in front of you, just pick them up. And he was like, it's so easy to think you need to go help the tsunami victims in Sri Lanka, but you just need to look around you and do some tiny little thing to pick up the people around you and not make it so huge that it's daunting and overwhelming. It's like, yeah, it's like my friend wanting to get on the plane and go to Israel and knowing, you know, that that was his impulse, but then maybe he could do something small with his community, which is he's now doing. Like, you know, we can even have the aspiration to do, do the huge thing, but applying the wisdom and going, can I do something 
with my immediate circle, even in a tiny way, to relieve the suffering. And that's awesome. And without that, we just are frozen, and then we just withdraw because it's too hard, and then we don't do anything, and then there's no benefit there, right? So think small, think local. It's sort of like food, you know, things. Like shop locally, you know, just do it with your immediate circle and just look around, you know, everybody's going through stuff like there's so many and being an empathic listener to somebody who's also upset about the thing you're upset about can help you both. And you just sit there and make time to have coffee and have a conversation. But we do. We're daunted because we think it needs to be some heroic feat. And it really doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. I think that when you want to take that that big leap, go to Israel. Is it um, wise or is it ego? And how do you tell the difference? Like, is it just misplaced with that or is it just... Yeah. I don't and I think for him, you know, it was an expression of my people are going through this thing. Yeah. I want to be there. Like, so it was beautiful and altruistic, but not, not much wisdom because it would just contribute to like one more American underfoot that needed to be rescued when he got taken, you know? So it came from this, like, Oh, I want to be there to support who I feel like my people are. And he knew that's, you know, there's nothing he could do. He's not going to join the army. He didn't even want to do that. He's a total pacifist meditator. Like he's not going to, you know, take up arms or do anything like that. But it was just this, you know, and we had that gut feeling of connection. So it was this beautiful kind of empathic connection that he knew wasn't the wisest thing. And so he could channel it into, well, there's all kinds of people I'm connected to and these conversations are so complicated. Maybe I can bring some nuance to the conversations in my community around this super complicated thing. And that's kind of what he's doing, right? So I think it can be ego, but I think it can just be out of born out of that need to like that impulse that we all have to help the people that we're connected to too yeah 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 is anybody on the zoomiverse i'm facing in the opposite direction let's take a break okay so we're on the home stretch last last two immeasurables we will fit them in but first of all, the near and far enemies of compassion. So we've been talking about some of the obstacles. So what do you think the opposite, the far enemy or the direct enemy of compassion would be? So what is compassion the antidote to? Apathy? No. Yeah. No. So the total opposite of compassion, cruelty, cruelty, right? Wanting others to suffer, right? So instead of wishing to relieve their suffering, wanting others to suffer. And then there's two flavors of near enemy or, you know, and two of you have mentioned it already. Pity. So pity is one because empathy is lacking with pity, right? It's not truly qualified compassion because it's like, oh, you poor thing. I couldn't imagine what's going on for you, but it must be awful from down there where you are, right? So that connection, that real connection and empathy really isn't there with pity. It's kind of hierarchical. It's like looking down a little bit. You might seem to have some care in there, but it's not that real heartfelt connection of compassion. And then there's another another obstacle or another um, near enemy where compassion gets off track. She's kind of the opposite of pity in a way. When you think of pity being a lack of empathy, it's almost like empathy gone overboard. Condescension. Well, that's kind of like pity, kind of because pity can be kind of condescending. Did you have an idea? 
We say kind of despair and overwhelm, oh. right? So, and we talked about that a little bit, like this idea of compassion burnout, which isn't really compassion, you know, but it's the idea of despair and overwhelm. Like it's too, like the suffering seems so concrete and so solid and nothing can ever be done. And like, so you just throw your hands and give up, but it's out of a sense of despair. So both of those are seen and they're kind of, we think of pity as almost not enough of the emotional connection of empathy. And then the despair usually comes from overwhelm with an unbalanced empathy without kind of looking at the dependence, again, not the wisdom piece being brought to bear. So interesting. And then the third of the measurables it's kind of probably wrong to have a favorite immeasurable <laughs> is empathetic joy. This is a real fun one. So empathetic joy, taking delight in others' happiness, right? And so we have kind of three levels of this. And this is one of the measurables that is a little bit different in the different Buddhist traditions. So all four measurables are found in all Buddhist traditions and even some ancient Indian philosophical traditions that aren't Buddhist. But immeasurable, so taking delight in others' happiness, any flavor of happiness, from the girlfriend in the new job all the way up to enlightenment, and then the next level, which is more emphasized in sort of the bodhisattva track, is taking delight in others' spiritual realizations, including liberation and enlightenment. So not, not only taking joy, and that was kind of what Anna was talking about before, not only just taking joy in their ordinary happiness, any kind of flavor of happiness, but taking delight in their spiritual realizations. And then in the Tibetan tradition specifically, another level is taking delight in people creating the causes for the ultimate spiritual results. So that's the one that's taking delight in others' virtuous actions, right? So not just taking delight in them having a good meditation and feeling warm and fuzzy compassion, but anything that they do, so any virtuous actions they do that creates the cause for the ultimate result. So we do that a lot in the Tibetan tradition. My teacher, Lama Zopa Rinpoche, he would often do group practices with us with what's sometimes called the seven limbs, like the seven practices that you do. And we'd be doing them and rejoicing is one of the practices and we get to rejoicing and then we do it for like two hours because he'd say it's the easiest way to create more virtue like being happy about somebody else's virtue there's this arithmetic in the buddhist scriptures and it says if you're rejoicing in the virtues of somebody with a lesser level of spiritual realization than you, I mean, who even knows who that is, you get twice as much virtue as they thought. And then if it's somebody at an equal level, you get like an equal amount. Like they do all the hard work and you're just happy about it? What a deal, right? And Lama Zopa was like, dude, that's such a good deal. Like totally capitalized. And then you rejoice in some Somebody of a higher level of spiritual realization you view, you get half. His Holiness the Dalai Lama, I mean, not since COVID, he used to travel around the world tirelessly, giving teachings all over. I would often log on to his website and just look at the pictures. They would always have this like slideshow of the pictures and just be happy. And I'd be like, I got half. <laughs> just from <laughs> you know, and who knows about the arithmetic, but the point is. The more that we're happy in others' virtues of everyone around us, and it is, it's such a good deal. Like I said, they go through all the hard work, and then you're just stoked about it, and you get all this sort of kickback, good karma. So Lama Zopa would always have us, he'd, you know, we'd be doing group practice with him, and he'd like, think of the Dalai Lama and all the things he's doing. Oh, unbelievable, 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 so amazing, 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 amazing. And then we go through another teacher and then another teacher, you know, and we just be like, oh, my God, you know, but the point was like such a great way. And so what would that empathetic joy be the opposite of? Like, what's the direct enemy, do you think? Jealousy. Yeah, exactly. Jealousy and envy. 
right? Yeah, yeah, jealousy. So instead of being upset that other people have happiness, so that person gets the new job or the new girlfriend or the new house or the new whatever, the good fortune, instead of going, how come they got it instead of me? I deserve that, right? That whole, that whole idea. And then the, the near enemies, it's really interesting. So the near enemy of empathetic joy is shallow, frivolous excitement. So that's super interesting. So somebody tells you about something amazing that happened to them, and you're like, oh my God, that is so amazing. That's the most amazing thing. Do you want pizza tonight or go out to the movie? Like it's just gone. Like you just have this over-the-top reaction. So it's not like this deep, heartfelt rejoicing and true happiness. It's just this frivolous excitement that you have when somebody tells you something great. And then you don't even remember it five minutes later, right? So that, I find that an interesting one. So it's like to really deeply, I was having a conversation with one of my best friends on the phone the other day and something had happened to him. And it was so amazing. And I knew it was something you really wanted. And I just kept saying it over and over, like, oh, my God, like, you've been working for this. You got, like, over and over. And at the end of this conversation, he goes, thank you so much for just really getting it. Right? I was like, oh, my God, that's great. Now what are we doing? Blah, 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 blah. You know, I just kept going, like, whoa, wow, amazing. So it's that deep, heartfelt, connecting happiness yeah all right yeah can there also be like a, an enemy to um, to rejoicing say more about how it would fit okay so as you know i was in prison for a long time yeah and i made some good friends there uh, yeah friends i'm not sure it was just catching <laughs> <laughs> so um some of my good friends um were found suitable with the role yeah and that brought a sadness to me because that meant they're going to leave me ah uh, right so right rejoice on them being yeah 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 and i don't want to lose that you know it's like yeah 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 interesting i mean i think in that circumstance because mixed with because you probably were happy they were found suitable but then there was the grieving of the loss which is really natural but it probably like i can imagine if you could have done something to mess up their chances you wouldn't have done that but it was just the natural grieving that we have of the loss because especially in a situation like that to really connect to somebody who really has your back and have a deep connection i know how hard that is so of course that would feel extra hard to lose somebody that you have that connection with so yeah so it's kind of like all of the above you're probably feeling that but i understand what you're saying about the attachment but i think that was just another emotional experience you were happening you were having around that whole thing of losing a friend right having the grieving of losing a friend probably while you were happy for them i mean how many of i of us have had that about somebody we love who is moving for a great like job opportunity or something right and they're moving and we're like oh i'm really gonna miss you but i'm so glad for you you know, so that's just kind of part of the mixed bag of human experience, too, I think. Yeah. Yeah, Connie. Um, I also was, um, trying to, if you didn't start off, that was by saying you can grow more, uh, in it like a growth mindset, because I've had an experience where I, I am really happy for somebody, but I'm also kind of envious. Yeah. <laughs> that, that I, you know, try to show that, or, or I think, you know, I, you know, I wish I could go on that back to the or, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but trying to take joy in for them, you know. So that, that's what I was okay. I was kind of like a little sad, but like, I can't just have the immediate joy. <laughs> and I mean, even to have the aspiration of empathetic joy instead of only just straight up jealousy, yeah. that's already huge, right? <laughs> I mean, honestly, to even think, oh, the, you know, at least I'm trying to override my jealousy about this amazing thing by trying to be happy for them. And that's such a huge start. You know, I often think like just willingness 
to even aspire to something different. That's part of the growth mindset too. We can't expect to be perfect. They don't call it practice for nothing. Right. And just, and then you notice over time, oh, then your default when something good happens to someone, even if it's risking them leaving you, is mo more and more percentage. You know, it's like the ratio of happiness to grief is more on the happiness side, or that's the overarching. And you just kind of notice that mm -hmm. it's like self correcting over time with the practice. Yeah. 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 But yeah, I think it's natural for it to be mixed. Yeah. You know, I find that when people have some amazing thing or they're able to go off to be with one of our mutual teachers for some retreat or something, and I'm like, oh my God, that's so awesome. <laughs> but most, you know, it's like 80% that's awesome, 20%, oh, I wish I'd been there, like fear of missing out. Yeah. But that's better than, you know, 100%, you know, grumpiness that they had some great situation yeah Anna. oh yeah oh do you can you guys hear you can even without the mic oh they can okay but you have a really soft voice so while you're up grab it <laughs> um so i i was kind of curious about the sort of the energies and the sensations um surrounding um empathetic joy and like and jealousy if mm -hmm. there's kind of a if there's kind of a, a similar just kind of process in the the experience if there's some sort of shared kernel of sensation and one content becomes jealousy and one content becomes oh, i don't know yeah. i was curious about that oh interesting like if they're kind of if they have sort of the same core but but depending on what, what happens. yeah well you know when you say that uh, one of my teachers, Zongzer Kansi Rimshay, I I, he was giving a talk once about emotions, and he said, jealousy, that's such a loser emotion. He's like, it makes you feel crappy. It makes the other person feel crappy. And I was really thinking of that, like, what's the function of jealousy? And I thought, it's showing us what we want, though. And so is empathetic joy, like how much happier we are about something that someone's experiencing, if it's something that we would want it to be experiencing too, just like feeling jealousy that somebody's getting something that's something we want. So maybe that's the common thread there is, is it something that we would also want to be experiencing? Then I think it's stronger, both, both things can be stronger. And if we can transform you know, into empathetic joy. But that feels true. I haven't heard anybody say that, but when I was investigating, oh, is jealousy really a loser emotion or is there some function to jealousy? It's like, oh, you wouldn't be jealous about somebody having something you don't care about at all. Like I'm kind of allergic to cats. Somebody gets a new cat, I'm like, good for you, but I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to be, je you know, something like that. So that may be a thread in there. That's a great, that's an interesting question. I'll think about that more. Yeah. Yeah, I know. So like Connie said, um, I do have the joy, but I also have a little bit of envy but in a way, that's um, that's good because you recognize your envy, yet yeah. you're able to overcome. Yeah, I don't know if you'd ever have pure. Well, maybe you could have pure. Joy. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but the fact that you overcome it. Well, it's that awareness and transformation yes, piece uh -huh, that we we're talking right, about before. Right. Like you're aware of it, and then you're able to go, "Oh, I'm having jealousy because that's something I want too." okay, that gave me the message, that's what I want. What can I do to get that? I don't have to take it away from the other person. But because sometimes my jealousy will surprise me because I didn't know I wanted the thing. And then I, I'm like, oh, wow, jealousy. Oof. Where does that come from? Oh, there's some aspect of what they're getting that's fulfilling a need that I'm not, you know, I'm not being fulfilled in that in my own life. So I think that's where the transformation can follow the awareness with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's experience it, shall we? <laughs> so again, empathetic joy, you know, in the Buddhist teachings I did for so many years, 
the teachers would just say, just feel it, just do it. But again, we can cultivate with our contemplation, empathetic joy too. And I love this. This is a meditation that Alan Wallace teaches, which is really the kind of first contemplative practice on empathetic joy that I was introduced to. And it's it just feels really nice. So I invite you to take it on board for your life. And we'll we'll do it together. I'll guide you through. So again, getting into your comfortable posture with your back straight and your shoulders even, your hands resting in your lap or resting on your knees, your tongue on the roof of your mouth right behind your teeth. Scanning through your body, just making sure that your posture is both relaxed and alert, the alertness with that nice upright spine, the body relaxed around that alert upright spine. And then settling with the breath for just a few moments. Just returning to the sensations of the breath when you find your mind wandering away. And so now, as we cultivate empathetic joy, bring to mind a personal acquaintance, or it could be somebody that you just know from afar, but someone who really embodies a sense of well-being, a sense of humor, resiliency, buoyancy, somebody who really radiates this sense of well-being, perhaps good cheer, happiness. Again, it could be someone who's either a personal acquaintance or just bringing someone to mind that you may know from afar. And bring them vividly to mind. Again, if it's easy to visualize them seated in front of you or get a felt sense of their presence, but really trying to bring their presence alive in your mind. And you can draw on your memory of maybe occasions where this person radiated this well being and this happiness. Maybe you witnessed this person really radiating this good cheer. And as you attend to this person, as they're image comes clear in your mind or that felt sense of their presence, really let their joy, their success become real. And then share in this person's joy by taking delight, rejoicing in this person's well-being. Just feel yourself resonating with their well-being, letting their well-being spark a corresponding sense of happiness in you. That's the empathetic piece of the empathetic joy. We're connecting to that emotional experience of joy in the other person.
And as you attune to this person and their happiness, also bring to mind this person's impact and influence on others, how others may often really resonate with this person's own sense of goodwill and well-being, just as you're resonating with it right now as you draw from memory. Think about how others really resonate with that person's well-being and the influence of this person on others and delighting in that influence and that impact that they make on those around them. And really feeling that heartfelt joy as you resonate with that person's well-being and the impact of them on others. And now bring to mind someone who clearly is creating the causes of happiness, someone who embodies kindness, compassion, wisdom, generosity, someone who's clearly cultivating and manifesting virtues in their life. It could be, again, somebody that you know personally or somebody you know from afar. Bring vividly to mind this person and their virtues, their acts of goodness in the world. And as this person and their virtues come clearly to mind, feeling that joy, that empathetic joy resonating with that person, feeling delight in their virtues. And then reflecting on the impact of this person on the world and on other people as they manifest their own goodness, their own virtues. How does that impact and influence those around them? And perhaps the actual benefit that they're able to do, really thinking of the impact of this person's virtues on others. thinking how wonderful it is that people are like this in the world that make themselves known and that act to benefit others, that offer their best to the world. And really taking delight, celebrating the other person's virtues and the impact of those virtues on the world.
And now invert your awareness, bring your awareness to bear on your own life. And drawing from memory, recalling occasions where you felt great joy, you achieved some success, some dream was fulfilled. When you experience true delight, so just as we can practice self-kindness and self-compassion, we can practice empathetic joy for our own happiness, our own delights, our own successes. So take empathetic joy in the person that you were, embracing in the spirit of rejoicing your own joys and delights. And then again, focusing on yourself, bring to mind your own virtues, occasions when your mind was wholesome, occasions when you really brought your best to the world, acts of kindness, of compassion, of generosity, your own acts of altruism, the actions and the mindset of virtue, recalling times when you brought your best to the world. And feeling delight in the goodness that you yourself brought to the world. Without shortchanging your own virtues, without making light of them, really deeply rejoicing, giving yourself credit for those virtues and feeling deep delight. And then release the visualization and just come back to the breath for a moment. And just feel whatever sensations are alive in your body, whatever thoughts there are in your mind. So this last piece that we did, self-rejoicing, is an interesting one. And we say it's the antidote to kind of discouragement and self-deprecation, right? Often, even when we're doing practice, when we're doing virtuous things, we never feel that we're doing enough. We can kind of second-guess our own virtues. Oh, if we're waking up, 
at six o'clock to meditate, we really should be waking up at five and meditating another hour. You know, we're never doing anything that's good enough in our spiritual practice. And it can be so discouraging over time, right? Because it's like we're always kind of shortchanging ourselves. We're never quite doing enough. So this idea of just rejoicing in our virtues is really the antidote to that feeling and that kind of attitude towards our own own virtues. And also, you know, the other extreme is going into arrogance, which we mostly don't do, but it's like, I'm so awesome because I meditate, you know? So those are kind of the near, you know, the near enemy. I mean, it's the antidote to to that kind of self-deprecation, but also the near enemy of rejoicing in our own virtues is if somehow it becomes all about us and we get arrogant. So we have to be careful about that. But I think we usually make the opposite fault of never giving ourselves nearly enough credit. I really saw that in my own practice. I was in a long retreat, meditating a lot. And it, you know, and it still wasn't good enough in my mind. And I was like, what is wrong with me? It's interesting, Paul Gilbert again talks about the evolution of self-criticism and self like the harsh inner critic that we have, which is often also comes up when we are trying to practice self-compassion and it won't allow us to. And it's really interesting what he says. It was so helpful for me. And he was talking in terms of evolutionary psychology. And he said, you know, we, we used to live in small interrelated groups of people that, you know, basically we saw the same people our whole lives. So he goes, Self-criticism was a way for us to self-evaluate where we fit in the hierarchy. And so we figured out where we fit, and we used self-criticism as a way to monitor our own status in the hierarchy. So that works if you're only around 150 people for your whole life. Like you figure out where you fit, and then you're pretty much done. That voice doesn't have to just keep going. But you think of the way that we live, like this thing that actually evolved to help us fit in. Like that's the function of that self-critical mind. Now we're meeting new people all the time, and we're all, like, so it's on overdrive. And I always think of that as like, the middle school cafeteria, the first day of school. So you're standing there with your tray of lunch and you're like, okay, if I go sit with the really cool kids and I'm not one of the coolest kids, then they're just going to shame me and I'm going to be humiliated. But I don't want to sit with the total nerds either because then I'll like have, you know, slotted into that space. So you're kind of trying to figure out like, where do you fit in your mind? is like, oh, don't do that because, you know, don't sit with the cool kids because you're not nearly as cool as that. Come on, like, let's be reasonable. You know, but we're doing that kind of all the time. So that self-critical voice can get so out of control, you know, for so many of us. So anyway, it sort of relates to the self-compassion and self-kindness piece too, is how, and to me, it was like seeing it as my friend that was trying to help me and having a conversation with my inner critic and going, thanks so much. You're trying to get me to fit in and belong. I understand how important that is, but you can take a break now. I've got this. You can take a back seat, you know, so it wasn't just kind of constantly running its program, but understanding it wasn't my enemy. It actually was really trying to help me, but it was just trying to help me in an environment very, very different than how I had evolved to live. So that's one of the things. So kind of the self-rejoicing, I really encourage it. My teacher, Lama Zopi, used to call empathetic joy, rejoyfulness, which I love. He just kind of coined this word, rejoyfulness. So that's a nice way of putting it. Any questions about that one or comments? Yeah, Jorge. Oh, <laughs> that looks so much like you were raising your hand. <laughs> Anything about that one? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was happy. Yeah. about... Um back to the kind of enemy of envy and something that I've been aware of is sometimes it feels connected to pretty ah. and other like attachment. Yeah. And I was just curious if those, yeah. Are. That's really interesting. Like, yeah, that thing of 
we feel we never have enough and that if well it kind of goes back to that thing actually uh, Ankita's question and that whole thing of the zero-sum game like if somebody else has something that means I'm deprived and I just find that conceptualization of reality leads to so much distress to think that there's a finite amount of resource. I mean, you think about immigration policy in the United States, like, I mean, from the personal all the way up to the global, there's this finite resources and we have to compete and get the thing. And I think sometimes jealousy can be that, oh, they got the thing. I never even thought about getting it, but if they got it, that means I don't ever have a chance of getting it. So I think that wrong view, you know, of of if somebody else gets something, then I'm deprived of the thing and really challenging that and just kind of going to more of an abundance mindset and more of a thriving abundance kind of mind, you know, because that really is the way so many systems work is not in that zero sum kind of way. So yeah, I think that's, it's definitely related. I think attachment and jealousy, in fact, in Buddhist philosophy, there's a list of 26 of these, they're called mental afflictions, and they kind of overlap a little bit with disturbing emotions. It's not quite the definition of the word emotion, but there's a lot of overlap. And they're all seen as coming from ignorance, attachment, and aversion. And so th there's this, in Buddhist philosophy, there's kind of this recipe of all of the 26 or some combination of the three. So jealousy would be like two parts attachment, one part aversion, a healthy sprinkling of ignorance, you know, is the recipe for jealousy. So they're all like composed of those three, what we call the poisonous minds in Buddhist philosophy. Yeah, 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 good, yeah. All right. Any questions or comments from the Zoomiverse? I'm not ignoring you. You're just to the side, everybody. I see you. I'm grateful. There you are. <laughs> okay. All right. 22 minutes for the last immeasurable. <laughs> and we may not have time to do a full meditation on this one, but I'll kind of explain the meditation. I'm sorry for that, but we have been having so many good discussions. So I want to show you a diagram that shows how the, that's the coolest thing in the world that shows how each immeasurable corrects for each other's near enemies. Mm -hmm. This is like super cool and totally worth skipping the next meditation, but you can do it on your own. So the last of the four, which sometimes comes first, and it's interesting, sometimes it comes first in the list and sometimes last, equanimity, a weird word in English. I used to teach international students in India and Nepal, and I'd say equanimity in the non-English speakers and most of the English speakers, we'd go, what, what, what? And I'd go, I know, I know, I know. Weird word, equanimity. And so it has different meanings in Buddhist philosophy, one meaning it comes up in mindfulness meditation, a mind free of attachment and aversion and judgment, right? A balanced mind free of, free of, you know, extremes and rooted in wisdom and free of discrimination is usually the definition. And in the context of the immeasurables, we talk about the quality of equanimity being free of strong partiality in relation to others. So being free of attachment to the people close to us, that we want the people close to us to have all the good stuff, aversion to the people that we dislike, wanting the people we dislike not to have all the good stuff, and indifference to the people we don't know, right? So mostly that's our default mode is attachment to friends and loved ones, indifference to strangers, and maybe even aversion to the people that we dislike or the people who don't treat us well. And so equanimity is saying, can we impartially wish for the happiness and freedom from suffering of all beings? Doesn't mean we have to like them, and this is important. Doesn't mean you need to invite them out for coffee after work and hang out with them. You can still dislike them, but you kind of have to love them. So that's different. You need to get to a place of wishing them well, 
even if you wish them well over there, away from you. That's fine, right? But it's the partiality of the partial partiality and the differentiation of wishing them to have happiness and freedom from suffering that we're talking about. And so the meditation that unfortunately we're kind of running out of time to do, but often what we do is think of a friend, an enemy, and a stranger. An enemy is like a person we dislike. And then we think about their relationship and the meditation you go over, the history with this person. At some point, we met them. I mean, everybody but your parents, you met at some point in your life, right? And when you met the person, they were a stranger. And then when did the relationship evolve into either friendship or the person I dislike? They did or said something. How much of what they did or said had to do with how you feel about yourself or how they you felt they made you feel about yourself. You know, I had this revelation when I was in this long retreat. I went to this uh, long meditation retreat and I had really, really close connections to people. And I remember when I went into long retreat, it's like, oh my God, I'm not going to see any of my friends for like this very extensive period of time. And like my friends and they're so amazing and they're so cool and they're the most awesome people in the whole world. I miss them so much. Then I started doing a lot of this meditation. I go, I thought my friends were my friends just because they're the coolest people and they like the same like cult movies and read the same authors and like, so, you know, had the same, of course, completely correct politics that I did and all this stuff. And then I go, oh, wow, there's plenty of people in the world with all those things. My friends are my friends because they think I'm cool and funny and they laugh at my jokes and they smile at me when I smile at them and make me feel good about myself. And then it was like, wah, wah. Mostly my friends are my friends because of me, because of how they make me feel about me. It's not really about them. You know, and same thing with the annoying people. Some of those same annoying people like the same cult films and great authors and had the same politics, but they didn't really like me and they didn't feed my ego in the same way as the people I labeled friends. So like looking at that labeling, and it doesn't mean that I didn't love my friends less, but I really saw the relativity of my relationships with people. And then it was like, how can I then differentially wish happiness for just the people who feed my ego, that doesn't sound very <laughs> virtuous, you know, and wish for suffering and even be a little bit happy when the bad things happen, like the annoying coworker and they're going through a bitter divorce and you hear about it. And you're like, that's terrible. Tell me everything about it, you know? Like so often. So again, it's not that you like everyone. There are certain people we get along with, certain people that we don't, and that's perfectly natural. But it's just about overcoming our preference in who is deserving of happiness and freedom from suffering and who is worthy of us working towards their freedom from suffering too, even if we don't like them. So that's what equanimity in this context is about. And so sometimes it comes last because it can be a correction for some of those near enemies that we talked about before. So it's like after doing the other immeasurables, go back to equanimity because that'll save you from the near enemy of attachment that we have with the loving kindness, you know, that saves us from all that, Arbel, all that partiality that can creep in. And then sometimes it's done at the very beginning because it's seen as laying the foundation for the development of loving kindness and compassion. Like if we have that impartiality, then that's kind of the groundwork for developing that loving kindness and compassion, especially immeasurably towards all beings, right? So that's what we can do in exploration in our meditation. And, and so the... Direct opposite of equanimity is attachment and aversion. So that's what it's the antidote for. And then the near enemy is indifference. Because we don't want our indifference to kind of devolve into just, or our equanimity to kind of devolve into indifference. Because it's not the same as indifference. Because it indifference is missing the care and concern and warmth of equanimity. 
it doesn't have the partiality piece, but it does have the care and the concern and the warmth. And then that's equanimity. We don't want to become equally indifferent towards all beings. That's not a platform for loving kindness and compassion. So equanimity, you know, often an overlooked immeasurable because it doesn't seem quite as yummy and juicy and sexy as loving kindness and compassion, but really, really important. I have a friend called Joey Weber, and he's a second generation Buddhist. He grew up in a spiritual community in the north of England. He was always curious about equanimity, and so he decided to do a PhD research on equanimity. And he wrote a book and does a six-week equanimity training that I did with him when he piloted it just to kind of support him and see what it was about. So interesting. And his book is called Why Mindfulness is Not Enough, because he found that often just mindfulness meditation focuses on the attentional component, on training the attention, but it's missing out on that non-judgmental piece and the equanimity piece, which is a platform for all those qualities like loving kindness and compassion. And he was talking, once we were talking, and he was talking about having equanimity for neutral experiences, that we need equanimity for the neutral, because he said, otherwise, we're like living our lives in the waiting room, waiting for the next pleasant experience. And I was like, whoa, right? So equanimity towards you know, that which is pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral, and in the context of the four immeasurables in relation to people. So unfortunately, I really want to respect our time, and there's one more thing I want to show you, so we don't have time to do that meditation, but that's how we do it. We visualize, again, the friend, the enemy, and the stranger, and then just investigate our relationship with these three people and how much does it have to do with attachment and aversion and how they sort of make us feel about ourselves. Okay. Questions about that one. This is Leslie. Joey Weber, W-E-B-E-R. And so he has a website with a lot of information. His book is amazing. His training is super amazing. Yeah, yeah, he's trying to really get all of that off the ground. Yeah, or so it's not really a question, it's more about I might be a question a little bit. Um when I was talking to my psychologist about all the people that went out of work. Yeah. She kept on asking me about how I heard somebody. Yeah. So I thought it would pop up, but I didn't really think yeah. I didn't um, because you know better and you know you'd be in such big trouble with me if you didn't <laughs> but, uh, I, I, um, I found out that uh, among the time that all this has been popping up I became more indifferent towards people ah uh, right yeah I would become more reckless mm. so, yeah like, a byproduct of like maybe my my desire to hurt has kind of like manifested in a different way. Yeah. I don't know what that's made. And I wonder if you're suppressing right which is turning into indifference like you're suppressing your feelings because you're you know you have these feelings that are maybe not so constructive so you're kind of tamping down all your feelings and it's turning into indifference. So just my attitude towards a lot of stuff that's going on is like, I'm just here to get a check. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Building into other areas of my life. Because it's really hard to suppress selectively. Like if we're, you know, out of fear of doing harm, and that's wisdom, but instead of... Yeah, I mean, I think that's what you're do. It sounds like that's what you're doing to control yourself from doing something that would, you know, cause harm. You're just kind of tamping down everything. And it's also having an impact on your feeling of care and connection for others, too. Yeah, so that might be interesting to look at. It's like, you know, and again, even when people have harmed you, can you care for them even if you need to have a distance like healthy boundaries you know no don't want to be close that's fine and can you care for them from afar or at least be open to the possibility 
And then I think you won't have to go to that extreme of indifference just to protect yourself, which sounds like it might be happening a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. 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 Um, I guess just with the indifference, I was just curious if, um, like how trauma and indifference yeah. are related. I, I felt like I heard some of that coming from Jorge that resonated, like maybe some traumas uh, from my, in my personal, in my life sort of made me indifferent. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I kind of felt like this similar where it's like almost too overwhelming. So you just like have to tamp it all down. Yeah. And block everything out. And you it almost makes me like isolate uh, yeah. and withdraw. Mm. And, uh, and I think that can be true. I mean, because often, right, especially for something like complex PTSD or things that happen repeatedly, it's usually in childhood by people who are meant to care for us. So it's like, oh, these people who are meant to be caring actually ended up causing harm. So I can't even trust care from others. And that came up actually as working with a group of people in the fears of receiving compassion from others. And that was really interesting because I was working with a group of young people, most of whom were some kind of childhood trauma survivors. None of them, it was so hard for them to receive care and compassion from others because it was so linked to the harmful experience for them. So I think that can be a byproduct too, is like our natural instinct to care and connect when, you know, we experienced harm from the people that we felt connected to in that way and caring for in that way. And then the whole thing feels dangerous to connect and care. And so we can go to that extreme of just shutting down and being indifferent because it's like the two things feel linked even though they're not linked. But I found with those populations, just receiving care and compassion can be such a struggle because it feels so linked with the acts that cause so much harm and trauma. So yeah, un unlinking you know, somehow unlinking those two things, which can be done with different kinds of therapies. I have a friend who's doing, who's a trauma survivor and she's doing EMDR, mm -hmm. you know, and finding, like she talks to me after every session, she's like, it's so weird, but it feels like it's super weird, you know, so there really are these modalities that help kind of unhook that linkage that we just make because of survival. Like mostly the stuff that we do, we just did as a coping mechanism to help us survive stuff that has happened in our lives. So we can't also like making friends with those parts that tried to protect us, but, you know, seeking out ways to overcome some of those default modes of protection. But yeah, I think I think that's what's happening. I have just one more question about yes. indifference. Like is indifference to feelings and strong emotions, is that mm -hmm. suppressing? Just or if you kind of I mean, I feel like it's like if I was to embody it, it's just like a shrug, like, oh I don't care. It's not it doesn't Yeah. You know, yeah. I kind of I think learn to do that just so I think it can be suppression. Yeah, I think suppressing. It, I th it feels like suppression to me. Does it feel like suppress? I mean, sometimes I don't we don't like even know we're suppressing. I mean, like before, like I was saying, since I couldn't express sadness and anger as a child, I didn't know I was suppressing it. I literally thought I just didn't feel those things until I did a lot of deep practice. Right. So I think. Yeah, I think it can be. I think it can be. It's interesting. You know, it's something we've done to protect ourselves, just sort of or push it aside or withdraw from it or kind of run away from it. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Comment kind of on the same subject. Um, I've I found what's um, been super helpful with like with emotions that I can't access or deal with um is like the inviting the emotion in mm. kind of practice um and allowing that thing to like live and mm. tell me whatever it wants to tell me and yeah and 
that that has been super helpful but i felt like for like a long time i couldn't really do it where it wasn't kind of trying to extend out in different ways i couldn't, mm. I, couldn't I couldn't let it sort of come into my awareness and be contained there and for me to be the observer yeah. of it rather than it you know me sort of becoming it and yeah reaching out in different ways yeah so that's just yeah and some of the practices that we do in the cultivating emotional balance are kind of building up that capacity to be able to be with the emotion because you've done practices like meditation on the nature of mind and you're able to not identify so strongly so it can be there but not feel like it's all of who you are you know so sometimes those strategies because i do feel that being present with emotions we have to to get the message but if we over identify then we're just completely flooded and kind of swept away in ways that can be unhelpful so like building up the capacity to be with the emotion without being sort of completely swept away and overwhelmed by it through some of those other contemplative practices. Yeah, yeah. Noam, you've got your hand up. I do, Speaking. thank you. Um, just such a great discussion. I wish we had another hour or two, but um, thank you for everything. Uh, there was a question in the chat about a diagram, and I'm not sure if it refers to the diagram that you would talk to earlier in the morning, or if there was one you just mentioned now that could you share that with us or direct us That's to it? The, the culmination, so perfect segue into the diagram, and then we'll dedicate the merit and have the announcements because I want to- Thank you. Time. Yeah, thanks, so. Thank okay, you. I'm going to share my screen, and I know I have this slide. I didn't have the right one before, but I've got the right one here. I'm going to share my slide. So hopefully, here we go. So this is this amazing, yeah, I don't know. Can you guys see this? Yeah, I'll explain it. I'm sorry, it's kind of small on the screen. So this is the way that all of the four correct for each other's near enemies. And I had, uh, this comes from classical Buddhist teaching. And once I was teaching this and I said, oh, it'd be so cool if there was a diagram showing this relationship. And one student, I thought she was doodling and I was getting really annoyed. And what she was actually doing was coming up with the perfect diagram. So I'll walk you through. So at the very top is loving kindness. And then you could see the red arrow goes to a little balloon underneath it, self-centered attachment. So that's the near enemy of loving kindness. And the antidote, you'll see the blue arrow, the correction for self-centered attachment is equanimity. So when we feel that our loving kindness practice is moving in the direction of that attachment, we need the person for us to be happy. The antidote to that is equanimity. And then the next one, empathetic joy. And it says here, fixation on hedonic pleasure, which is just that sort of frivolous excitement that I was talking about that was the near enemy. Then the antidote for that is loving kindness. And it's more that sincere joy in their deep causes of happiness, not just this five second, oh my God, that's awesome. And on to the next thing. So loving kindness is the antidote to that kind of frivolous hedonic pleasure. And then compassion and the antidote to despair is empathetic joy. So no matter what kind of suffering people are going through, because they're human beings, it's always a mixed bag. And there's something going on in their life that gives them happiness. So attuning with empathetic joy, just to balance out the overwhelm that sends us into that place of despair. And then the equanimity, the aloof indifference, that's the near enemy for equanimity, apply compassion, right? So that deep feeling, that's the warmth, that's the care, that's the connection that'll be the antidote to that indifference. So isn't that cool? 
yeah, that's like the key right there. So I'll go ahead and leave that up for a minute so everybody can make a screenshot or your phone or all of the above. <laughs> well, you know, Alan Wallace, the teacher I referred to that taught the empathetic joy, he has a couple of books on the four immeasurables. And those are, I mean, there's so many. A lot of them are super traditional, like Tibetan Buddhist approaches, which are also great. But yeah, Alan Wallace's books on the four immeasurables are really, really good too. Yeah. All right. So, the diagram of student group? Yes. So she was drawing this, and I was like, oh, that's brilliant. So I'm all about a good diagram. Yeah, a good diagram is worth a thousand words because I'd always had the explanation. It was like, there's got to be a way to show it, like visually in a diagram. So Thea Fast, kudos to Thea Fast from Williams Lake, British Columbia, who came up with a diagram when I was doing a emotions training for the Canadian Mental Health Association. So there you go, random. What's that? The shape of it is sort of easy. Isn't it? I know, it's all swirly and nice. In color coded, no less. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'll take. Can I take it down? Everybody got it. Yeah. All right. So we're gonna let's see. Let's dedicate the positive energy. We're dedicate the merit of today. One minute over, but that's not bad. And then I think Cage has some announcements. But let's, first of all, just take a moment to just let all of our virtue with empathetic joy for ourselves and for everybody in this room and just what we've created collectively. And I always say, just think about today, the 21st of October, how many people have spent six hours today focusing on the, the four immeasurables, focusing on virtue, probably very few. So amazing, the amount of virtue through our meditation, through our discussion, through our investigation, really trying to take this to heart. So let's dedicate all of that positive energy that we may be able to cultivate the four immeasurables in our own mind, heart, and by that cultivation, be able to develop the bodhicitta, that altruistic intention to gain the highest spiritual goals for the benefit of all beings, thereby bringing all beings to full awakening, dedicating all of our personal and collective energy towards that goal. Thank you all so much, all of you on Zoom, all of you in person for your attention all day long. It's been so great to be with all of you. For me, the time just flew and I wish we had another couple of hours, but I know everybody's exhausted. <laughs> that was, <laughs> yeah, but it was really a great pleasure. And thank you to everybody from San Francisco Dharma Collective for inviting me. It was really great to be with you all again. I feel like you're my family in the northern part of the bay. So yeah, thank you so much. Yeah.